everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the TetraCast. This is RPG Site's weekly podcast where we get the site staff together to talk about our favorite genre of video games. My name is Brian Vitali. I've already had my beer. I'm ready to go. Joining me today is the full usual crew. Full usual crew. We have Josh Torres. I've only had coffee and bread. That seems like a good pairing. We have Adam Vitali. I have tea, as usual. How many times has it been steeped? Uh, it's still steeping. Still steeping. Mm. I just keep the bag in there. <laughs> Perpetually all alone. I've got coffee. And Chow Min Wu. I got milk tea. Oh, that sounds good. I, now I'm craving milk tea sometime today. Somehow we are already approaching halfway through November. We've had a few releases this week that we want to talk about. Just, just to state it outright here at the top of the podcast, the two games that we're going to be going into this week are Like a Dragon Gaiden, The Man Who Erased His Name, and then the somewhat surprising release of the Tales of Arise DLC slash expansion, Tales of Arise Beyond the Dawn. So these are the two releases that came out in the last seven days, so we're going to focus on those. And then we do have a handful, a smattering of news. We had um, N7 Day. We had the announcement of a of a Nintendo IP movie that a lot of people have been predicting for a while. And then we have a lot of release dates that kind of are starting to flesh out what early 2024 is going to look like for us. Uh, so we're going to start out with uh, Like a Dragon Gaiden, The Man Who Erased His Name. This is a game that we talked about in a few instances uh, on the podcast because it was announced alongside Like a Dragon as Shin. We've had a, a couple RGG Studio live stream events that have detailed the game. Of course, we've got Infinite Wealth coming out next year with a somewhat surprisingly early release date. Isn't it coming out in February? January. Uh, late January. January. Oh, right. Yeah, late January. And then uh, Like a Dragon Gaiden was kind of like a bonus on top of all of that. A Shin was a surprise as a remaster that had never officially released in English. Um, we knew that uh, Like a Dragon, Yakuza 8, whatever you want to call it, was going to appear in some fashion. But then we also got the spinoff story uh, and kind of marketed as a return to form for the brawler style Yakuza game. I'm going to call it Yakuza. Sorry, it's yeah. just habit. Um, <laughs> yeah. Featuring featuring Kiryu, not turn-based, uh, very traditional Yakuza gameplay, kind of what, what some people were afraid we might not see again, at least not in a traditional format. We didn't know is, is the Judgment series going to be what we have for the brawler style gameplay? You know, is uh, it was something that was a bit of a surprise, and we don't really know until this podcast uh, what was in store for us. So luckily, uh, resident Yakuza Like a Dragon expert Josh Torres was able to go hands-on with Like a Dragon Gaiden, and I've also played it a little bit as well since it released a couple days ago at the time of recording. So I will hand the proverbial microphone over to Josh. Josh, what is... Like a Dragon Gaiden, and how has your time been with it so far? So, yeah, like you mentioned, uh, Like a Dragon Gaiden is a very traditional Yakuza game. You know, Yakuza 0 through Yakuza 6, it is very much, it's not the turn-based uh, thing that they did with Yakuza Like a Dragon, which they're also returning to in Infinite Wealth. It is very much Kiryu goes up to a group of thugs on the street, and you beat them up all in real time. Uh, like. Uh, good amount of the games of the series, the way and, things should be. <laughs> yeah, um, and this is uh, an interesting spinoff. Well, I wouldn't even really call it a spinoff. Almost, it's it's like a, a companion game, uh, but in, that's chronologically in between the events of Yakuza Six and Yakuza Seven. This game starts off right away with the finale of Yakuza Six, and then it's chronicling what Kiryu has been up to s- till his um appearance in yakuza 7 um and i think for a lot of us that has stuck with the series with kiryu uh, for a long time now this is a, a welcome addition because going to um yakuza like a dragon when you got up to that part where kiryu appears uh, it didn't really make sense for a lot of us uh who have played these games because of the way yakuza 6 ended and yakuza 6 was uh, was you know it was motioning that that this this feels like this is Kiryu's a re- real final game. It looks like a big send off for him, and the way that things ended up in that game, it just didn't really make sense of why, how he appeared the way he did in Yakuza Like a Dragon. So, Like a Dragon Gaiden is sort of a uh, a companion piece 
that details w- exactly what Kiryu has been up to. And not and, only that, but like Yakuza Like a Dragon before it released, it was very much marketed and still was in many respects, kind of like a passing of the torch. Like, here's mm-hmm. your new face of the franchise. Here right. is here's Ichiban. And then um, talking about all of these games, six, seven slash like a dragon, and then this mid quill side quill companion game, it's going to be a little bit difficult because some of the premises like Kiryu is not dead. You kind of have to state outright. You can't speak around that. <laughs> but then at the same time, y- there are certain story instances that we we don't want to talk to all the details of those right. companion games because we can't really do them justice in the amount of time that would be reasonable for a podcast. So the sort of things where we kind of have to make assumptions about what you know, speak around what you don't. I mean, I'll be, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, be, I'll be very direct with it. Yeah, I'll yeah. be very direct with it without, without, you know, I won't beat around the bush. Of like, you know what I'm, mm. what I'm talking about. Obviously I won't spoil any, like any key like story stuff that happens in here. Um, but yeah, I mean, just to just know going in that like when we're talking about this game, it is already assuming that like even even the game is outright right, as soon as you start the game already assumes you know what's kind of happened to carry you up to this point. It doesn't have like a it doesn't have um you remember in previous Yakuza games, right, where you go up to like a gravestone or something. It's like, do you want a recap of like what happened before? It doesn't do that, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it, it it's very much expects you to know what is what carry you is up to right now. Um, yeah, one of the very first cutscenes is basically a flashback towards the end of Yakuza Six. Yeah, it is. A, it is. It is assuming you have played Yakuza Six. Yeah, and and th- that flashback will mean nothing to you at all if you don't have any context of what's going on in it. Basically, um, you know. So it's not that going mm-hmm. in. So, so um, the premise of this game, um, that at the end of Yakuza Six, uh, Kiryu uh, pretty much faked his death. He he took a bullet. And uh, protecting some of the people that he loves, and uh, they assume that he's dead. And ever like he made it that way, so like he can pretty much operate more freely. Like he did, he didn't expect to like survive that. So at the end of Yakuza Six, he survives that. He's pretty much on a hospital bed, and he makes a deal with this politician. And their deal was like, I'll take your like. He knows something about this politician. He's like, I'll take your secret to the grave in exchange. Please fake my death. You know, I don't want anyone to know. Please, please take life. my death and keep the people that I love safe. Like, yeah, because they, because they're we, kind of like it's it's kind of like a two way blackmail in a way. Right. Yeah, because because the, because uh, Kiryu recognizes that like him just existing like causes problems for the people that he loves because he established this morning glory orphanage in Okinawa, and any time that trouble followed him, uh, ever since he established an orphanage. That people who knew him uh, would always target the orphanage as well, um, or, or the residents around it. So he's like, the only way to keep them like definitively safe in his mind is like, is to erase me out of the picture, and so people have no more reason to like go after that because people went after it to get to him, pretty much. Um, so now he's working for, uh, uh, a few few years later uh, after Yakuza Six. He's kind of gone undercover. He's uh, you know at this shrine and uh and once in a while this mysterious daidoji faction uh calls upon him to do kind of like the dirty work they're kind of like a faction that deals with the criminal underworld um and he goes under the code name joryu so a lot of the people in this game were named as joryu you know a very creative uh you know <laughs> undercover name for Kiryu here it's very so, much clark kent here I've, I've got i've got these thick rim glasses now i'm i'm joryu Mm-hmm. Well, that that works, okay? Henry Carroll tried mm-hmm. it, you know, <laughs> in real life, wearing glasses. Nobody recognized he was a celebrity, okay? All right, well, there we go. L- living proof. Um, and so, I, 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 in, 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 you know, Yakuza fashion, um, as you're kind of getting used to, like, what Kiryu's been up to under this uh, criminal faction, something happens where, like, these mysterious assailants uh, that have been in a mission gone wrong. And like, kind of the the sense of his past is starting to kind of catch up to him. Was where they were, even though it's been like maybe two to three years after the events of Yakuza Six and faking his own death, there are still some people uh, in the Yakuza world that are not convinced that he's entirely dead. So, there that that that's kind of the core, uh, like you know, framing of the plot line where um, the the Omi Alliance is still looking for Kiryu. 
And I won't say what the reason is, but if you played Like a Dragon already, or Yakuza Like a Dragon, you already know this reason because Kiryu's, when Kiryu shows up, it's during a certain plot beat in that game, so you already know why they're looking for him if you played that game. So this, this is kind of an interesting companion game where you it's kind it's kind of one of those things where it's hard to be unpredictable in what's going to happen in this game because you ultimately know the end point if you played Yakuza 6 and Yakuza 7 and the game already expects you to have played Yakuza 6 and Yakuza 7 because yeah, you know the start and you know the end yeah and, and and later on and you haven't got to this Brian but like later on there'll be um scenes from Yakuza 7 slash Yakuza like a dragon that like kind of like kind of recap the events of what the of what, what that game's undergone to show you like the what's happened in that timeline already to kind of like get you up to like a speed of like okay it kind of does a time skip up until a certain point in the game for an event that's about to happen so you kind of get like the super cut of like uh yakuza 7 events that transpire in the meanwhile during that time skip you know so it's like it's not beating around the bush of like it's not trying to keep the, the events of yakuza 7 a mystery at all in that game um either so so, so you it's, so, it's hard it, to... so even though it takes place before yakuza 7 it is and there's even a few things early on that it's clearly intended to be played assuming you know what happens in yakuza 7 yes it's it's definitely a clearly a prequel in that specific context like there's even one point where um, this is pretty early in the midquel or mid whatever you want to call this game <laughs> where you're at the you're at the um the homeless camp in Yokohama. Yeah. And they and it very cheekily goes like, yeah, the guy that lives over there, I think he's been a nurse recently or whatever. And it's um speaking about Namba. Uh it doesn't show him, but it very clearly teases like, yeah, that you know, references to, to the other game. Isn't that isn't that neat? You know, isn't that exciting? And oh, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then this because you know, there's all the while it's supposed to be showing what Kiryu's been up to. So it kind of gives it kind of gives those players who maybe have only played Yakuza Like a Dragon, a certain like reference point in the timeline as well of what's going on. Um, but you even go to the uh, there's even an event at the oh, I'm blanking on the name, the bar Sunrise Surprise at Yokohama. I'm trying to think what it is. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about. Yeah, the one um, letter it's a one word name that starts with S, and I'm blanking on it. <laughs> I'll look it up while you keep talking. Yeah, but uh, in terms of you know, um, uh, any if there's any surprising things in the story, like uh, uh, in general, like the 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 story that they tell in this game is, it's pretty self-contained, but it's like amusing enough. It's a very, it's a it's a it's a traditional like Yakuza type of storytelling, except they're just an all new crew. Um, pretty much like Kiryu is the that you know, definitely on his own in this game. You don't really see many familiar faces that you've seen in the in the past when it comes to like the main story. It's pretty much a whole new plot. So you kind of have this um, internal struggle between Kiryu um, and the Daidoji faction early on, where like um, there will be certain like requests that the Daidoji faction asks of him, and like if he doesn't re- comply to those requests, then amusingly enough, it comes back. It circles back to the core problem. Like if you don't do what we ask of you, we're gonna go um, attack the orphanage. You know that you're trying to protect. So you know, once again, being black, <laughs> uh, he finds himself blackmailed um, for doing the, you know, engaging in things that he necessarily necessarily doesn't want to do, but he has to uh, to protect the people that he loves. This time behind the scenes, um, and then uh, aside from that, it's uh, the the main story is pretty thin uh, runtime wise. If you're just casually playing, staying to the like, the main plot, you'll easily uh be under 10 hours in this game um so a lot of this game's content is padded out by side content which is fine honestly i don't i don't really mind it that much because the the side content is fun enough and just uh, the, the the thing that bothers me is the way that like they kind of integrate a lot of that side content into you can tell that they're trying to pad out like the length of the main story by having you go do other stuff um in it so like for example, uh, there's this uh, one very, very early story beat where um, Kiryu goes to Sotan Mori um, because he's been asked to find this um, jack of all trades fixer named Akame um, because well, 
during an early story beat, uh, one of uh, Kiryu's associates gets kidnapped, and in order to get him back, he has to go kind of participate in, uh, has to go to another place, participate in something to get them back, or at least learn the lo- location of where they are to go get them back. So he goes to Sogenbori, mixes, uh, f- meets up with this fixer, her name's Akame, and then um, before you go off and go to the other location to go participate in that said thing to uh, save that associate of his, he, uh, like, Akame keeps delaying it. It's like, oh, you know, we can't go right now. In the meantime, go do this other thing. And then it's like, it's like okay, can we go? Now it's like, mm, not yet, not yet. You, go, you have to go do this other thing uh, first uh, for me, please. And it's like, and I, it, it kind of it kind of strings you along and delays story beats with kind of like almost minor errands that, you know, it's, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it, it, it definitely, you can, you can feel kind of like that stretching of, of the main story to, and adding in kind of more things that's busy work and doesn't really feed into anything. And that's also um, another uh, prevalent way of like seeing this uh, sort of dynamic in the, in the game is when there's a, there's a, you, you finish a story beat and there's this new thing called the Akame Network. Since Akame Network is this jack of all trades fixer, she runs this network, and she primarily uh, established herself as like someone who helps the homeless population in Sotenbori. But you know, as her network has expanded, like her assist network has expanded, her operations have expanded, and then so she sometimes dabbles into the criminal underworld too, uh, in terms of certain requests. Um, so this Akame network is something that you actually level up by doing like simple requests. Like on the there'll be marked NPCs throughout Sotenbori, uh, and and the castle, which is the other place, um, where people will have very simple requests like, hey, can you go get this consumable with me? I need like this health item. Can you get me this certain food item? Um, I lost an item. Uh, can you please find it for me? And then usually it's like up above them, and you have to go use this new spider wire gadget to kind of you know get grab it and then give it to them sometimes it'll be like hey can you dress a certain way or look a certain way because that'll make my child happy so you go to a boutique to go alter curious appearance make him have a clown face and then it's like great my my, my child loves that thank you so it's like very simple request. I, will, I will say is that the the kami network has a very, at least to me, it was a very bad first impression because uh-huh. it opens up with these micro requests. Yes. Um, where it's like, you see the exclamation points on the map, which I'm conditioned to think, oh, sub story. This can range from anything from uh, a small story arc to introducing me to a mini game to a little self contained story. But no, it's like, I want a potion. Can you get me one? I want a bento box. Oh, can you beat up these two thugs? Oh, thank you so much. You beat up those two thugs. Uh, oh, can you get the soccer ball out of the tree? Mm-hmm. Um, press X on the tree, get the soccer ball. Thank you. You're done. I'm like, really? That's it? I will say, though, that once you integrate with the Akami network more, you get some more traditional sub stories. You learn a little bit about the, the quote unquote like currency, uh, the way you can like tear up what you have access to, things like that. It gets a little better. Um, and then yeah. every Yakuza yeah. game has some sort of completion list where you go into a menu and it's like, have you ordered all these things? Have you played these mini games? Have you located all these things? And it's very much a checklist that is very anyone who's played any Yakuza game knows of. And that's kind of been integrated into the economy network. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. That actually is pretty good. Yeah, so, so bad uh, first impression. Once you go into it a little bit, I was I, I softened on it uh, once I kind of. Yeah, it but, a bit but that, uh, yeah, and that's all to feed to my main central point that like all these things you do feed into like an experience bar for the economy network to level up. So the, but there'll be some pi- some points during the main story that be like your main story objective will be like, go level the economy network to like level eight or something or level 10. And it's like it's like oh you don't have like a clear like it's like it's one of those states it's like you're delaying main story progression almost arbitrarily just to you know because you want to level this Akami network up because they're, they're trying to get they're trying they're trying to you know kind of stretch the game out a bit more um, so you get more you know gameplay time out of it and not, so at that at the cost of like kind of almost having like a fluid uh, pace to the story. 
Uh, which is, that is you know, like, reminding me of like another game that's done that. There's probably multiple examples, but I swear there's another game that has a very similar thing where there's some sort of tiered system that you have to meet benchmarks before it lets you progress the main story. It, 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 someone mentioned this, and it's not it's not as egregious as this, but someone did mention it is it is a very familiar uh, Xenoblade Two Torna expansion. Oh, it. yep, that's it. Mm-hmm. Where where <laughs> you kind of you you're forced to do the community stuff in that game to get main story progression. Now it's not as like as egregious as that. It, it's it, it's pretty trivial once you start getting things going uh, in it, but it's just one of those things like you just notice that it's like, ah, oh, my next main story uh, beat is not going to this place to meet someone. It's to level the Akame network. Okay. And and then it, it also does this for like, it'll have like, it has, there's a Coliseum at the castle, and one of some of the main story stuff is like, go reach like gold rank at the Coliseum. It's like, there's not really a, a compelling st- plot reason for it. It's just like, please just get to it. Okay, great. And 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 the, and the, and the main story is the reason is because the next story beat is at the VIP lounge that unlocks at the gold ring, arbitrarily. You know? So it's like, mm-hmm. okay, all right. Um, and now, Remind me, I hope my memory is not failing me. The castle is a new location, right? Yes, it, it, it does it's have just this. It's very it, similar to Purgatory. Which is, yes. Okay. Yeah, it, it is. It is a new location. The, the castle is like an offshore platform, uh, an entertainment district, secret to the outside world, on an offshore platform. That you know, and, and yeah, it's it's very it's very very flashy. Neon lights, bright lights everywhere. Has a recreation replication of Osaka Castle, uh, in it. Where but Nishikani I remember, and I, I forget if it's Kiwami or Kiwami Two, or if it was in the original Yakuza mm-hmm. One or Two. But when you first go to Purgatory, you like go into like this submersible, and then you like go under the city, and then it's a similar thing where it's like, did you know there's, there's a secret casino slash entertainment district down here? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And then and then and then it, and then it shows up in several other games, and now it's just like this is a similar sort of thing, but it's offshore on a on an aircraft carrier or on an oil rig next to yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, like oh okay though. yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, it's. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not really judging that. I'm like, oh, couldn't couldn't this have just been purgatory? And then every time, you, and then every time you want to visit it, you have to go to, to talk to Akame and be like, I want to go to Castle. And then, like, what's shown off screen is like they have to go call the helicopter to go get you to the Castle. <laughs> you know, it just it's whatever. You know, it's it's dumb, but it's not, I won't hold it against. It. <laughs> but it's uh, yeah, it's it's dumb in the same way that purgatory was dumb. Yes. So. Yeah. No judgment. No judgment rendered, despite how it might sound. Mm. Um, but yeah. Um, in terms of gameplay, like you said, it's a it's a return to form of the bra- the beat 'em up brawler. The the main new thing in this game is uh, Kiryu has access to you know his standard Yakuza brawler style, the more the 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 familiar move set of Kiryu that you've had for pretty much all the games up until, up until this point. But the, he has a new style called Agent. Uh, agent is a much more. It's the. It's, you're kind of stuck with this stuff for like the first hour or so until you unlock Yakuza stops because they're, they're trying to push you to, you know, explore like what makes Agent uh, different from the standard uh, brawler style. In this style, um, Kiryu is much more agile. He has longer combos. He has shortened damage, but he has more combo potential. Um, so he he it kind of reminded me of Yagami from Judgment, uh, in a way the way he moves uh, throughout it. Um, but the the main gimmick with Agent, he has, he has access to these uh, sci-fi gadgets, almost like a, a Mission Impossible esque type of like tech level um, uh, integrating it into your to, to your battles. So like the first one you have access to is like I mentioned, this spider wire, where you basically become a sort of like a budget Spider Man almost, where he, you're not really swinging around, but you can use it to. Uh, uh, to shoot out a wire, and you if you upgrade it, you can show, shoot out more wires at once against people, and you can like uh, shoot it at them and just leave them like kind of tied up for a, for a few seconds, or you can use it to flinging them around to other people or to environmental objects, or you can uh, use them to kind of pull them into you, so you can like uh, um, uh, get them into range of like your combos. You can even use it like in the middle of like your 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 combos sort of do a ground bounce <laughs> and extend the combo which is really funny um uh, other gadgets you have are like these drones that you can call in to uh, kind of distract and kind of bug people uh you can call it a bunch of them at once 
um you have these uh these rocket boots that you can use to kind of uh go around arenas and and battles like faster you can reach the ram into people and you have like, then exploding ex- cigarettes yes <laughs> you, you basically have a grenade but it's a cigarette um where you can you know toss it out and then after a certain amount of time it'll explode and you can if you upgrade it you can toss more of them out and do like chain explosions and all that stuff well what do you what do you think about this new thing brian <laughs> I'll be honest, most of the time I've been playing, I've been using both. I've been using both the agent and the uh, the other mode is basically like his Yakuza fighting style mode. Yeah. Um, I did. I have used the wire and the drones a lot. I don't really like the cigarette just because the, it, when it explodes, it kind of like stuns you. I don't know if you can eventually make yourself like impervious to it. Um, the, the rocket boots are OK, but I feel like at least unupgraded, they don't. They're not very useful. Like regular sprinting is just as good. A lot of these, they might become more utility once you just go and spend some, you know, there's an upgrade kind of, I don't know if tree is the right word, but there's an upgrade system very similar to other Yakuza games where you spend a combination of either Akami points or just yen to upgrade your, your health, your heat, and then, you know, these these gadgets. Um, and I haven't really interfaced with like the upgrades much yet, mm-hmm. but I have been using the drones and the spider wire a fair bit. Okay. And and what's uh like you said like you're in chapter 2 right now, you said? I th- yeah, I I got, I got through chapter 1. I'm about partway through chapter 2. Um I did like the events at the Colosseum where there's a lot of fan service for yeah. uh series history. Mm-hmm. Uh it's like here here's a retelling of an event in Yakuza 1. Here's a retelling of an event in Yakuza 2. Uh and in a kind of goofy very Yakuza way. And it's it's one of those things where it's a little bit contrived but i'm actually I'm like i i'm just gonna be you know just enjoy this it's it's silly and it's good yeah uh in a, in, a, in a way where if you haven't played those games you're not really that, that'll be that'll be a hard question to answer like who who should play this game do you have to play every single other yakuza game well there's probably something in it for you if you have like those events at the coliseum but i wouldn't call those necessary i, th- I, 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 six, I think i think the most good. important like You'll get a better. I won't. I won't. I won't answer that question directly right now. But you'll get a better answer for that question once you see the ending of this game. Um, as mm-hmm. I mentioned this in my review, like even if you decide to skip out on this game because, like, hey, I'm just waiting for the next mainline game. Um, I, I highly recommend you to at least watch a YouTube video of the entire ending segment because it is like one of the most emotional and most powerful. Like scenes ever in in the yakuza series and that's it's going to be very meaningful in varying degrees for people who have played this series and uh and you'll know which installments will hit the hardest out of i mean not brian um mm-hmm. um um after you watch it and then you'll get a better uh, sense of like oh okay if you've definitely played like these titles this this means a lot more to you than someone who has only maybe played only zero or only Kiwami one, or only uh, like a dragon, you know. Um, yeah, and, uh, currently, it's very clearly, and you could have guessed this just by where the game is placed. Is like you really, really should play six. You really, really should play seven. If you've played zero, or yeah, zero Kiwami or Kiwami two, there's been little fan service moments for all three of those. Not so much four and five yet, but I'm sure they're coming. Like you, like as part of the game, this is very Yakuza. You walk by a pocket racing circuit, and as part of the main story, you at the very least have to step in. Luckily, the game doesn't force you to like do a session, at least not yet. But he's like pocket racing. I remember when I was into that, and then there's like a little clip of very young Kiryu from Zero as a <laughs> pocket racer. It's like, oh yeah, you know, I mean, that's kind of uh, what they were going for by bringing back pocket racing in the first place. Uh, yeah, it's kind of th- th- that's you know, and, and pocket racing for some people is kind of. <laughs> A highlight of the series because it's such a it's it, it's a it's probably more in depth than it really needs to be but it is <laughs> and it's a, mm-hmm. and it's super fun to kind of tweak around it but if you have any problems with pocket racing i i highly recommend i wrote up a guide for pocket circuit in, the, in this and i did all the testing and everything and it's it's all up there and apparently it's doing well so if you're having trouble and you need, and you want to see the all the pocket the pocket circuit storyline and i got your back I've solved it. At, at least, you know, after hours and hours of 
seeing here you fall to the floor after his pocket racer <laughs> falls off the track <laughs> you have to at least see brian all the all the scenes of like here you winning a race here you losing a race uh, uh, or like here you getting like not first place and care you falling off the track. <laughs> They're all very good. <laughs> yeah, if if I were to interface with any like sub content in this game, like the economy network, it, it's set up in a way where you can do it in like little micro sized chunks. So I've messed with that a little bit, but yeah, pocket racing would be the big thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, one and this this is this might sound a little bit. I don't know if shallow is the right word, but because it's been a handful of years since we've played a game in this style, starring Kiryu, you know, when did Yakuza Six come out? Twenty. 20- 16. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then Kawami 2 came and, out 2017, I think, or something like that. And then I'm assuming this, I actually haven't double-checked this, I'm assuming that this is, uh, one of the one of the smaller headlines with Yakuza Ishin is that it wasn't Dragon Engine, it was Unreal Engine, and I assume that this is also Unreal Engine. This is uh, Dragon know. Engine, because this is using this the same is engine. This is Dragon Engine? Uh, this is Dragon Engine, because it's using the same okay. engine as Yakuza Infinite Wealth. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so only a Shin went to Unreal Engine. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, either way, regardless of which engine they're using, though, I'm good. Thank you for setting me straight on that. Uh, this game just looks really nice. It's just, it's just a very pretty game, and it runs at least uh, on on the PC version I'm playing. It's running really well, and it's just like, damn, this is. It's kind of speaking about Tales of Our Eyes. How one of the things about that game is just you could tell the production values have gone into it. Like, yeah, like any other game from the studio, it uses it reuses a lot of animations and locations to, i think to a smart extent but just it's a, it's really nice to play a game because obviously the the judgment lost judgment games just recently came to pc a year ago is that last summer like summer 2022 when those came out mm-hmm. it wasn't that long ago and those games look pretty pretty nice with their uh recent pc ports and then this game just looks and, and runs really nice uh, on pc not that yakuza's uh like kawami 2 or or six for stinkers. Those also, you know, were, were fun uses of the dragon engine. But I think the dragon engine was really, really like hard on yeah like at it, the time. Yakuza six also was like the first dragon engine game. So you could definitely see like if you go from Yakuza six to this game, you see you, you kind of see like a microcosm of like all the improvements the dragon engine and refinements the dragon engine has gotten over time. Mm-hmm. This game is is very pretty, especially the lighting. In this game, yeah. So you can definitely see that they've really been working away at the dragon engine for years and it's really paying off uh for them i'm glad that i'm glad they haven't dropped it i'm glad they're not just yeah. going to unreal so. yeah i i think i think it's working out for them really well um and then after you complete like a dragon guy then you get access to all the infinite wealth uh demo stuff for this game they have like two two modes you have a a story mode that picks up uh right after like a dragon guy Den's uh final cutscene. And then adventure mode, which is pretty much the the Tokyo Game Show uh, demo without the time limit. So you you're in Hawaii, you have a you have a party, and you can kind of go mess around in this like li- like you know this small area in the full game and do like some of the mini games. So let's go see. But then you can like all the new stuff they've added to the combat system um, and all that. And that that's uh, that's sort of the, and also um, I was about to say that's part of the reason why. This game is so big because, like, you think it like there's a there's a smaller scope, like, uh, game, and its its runtime is pretty short relative to like even the small smallest mainline Yakuza games. But it's like what like sixty five to seventy games, or maybe even more than that. And like the 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 one of the main reasons is one you have all this uh, uh, like a dragon uh, infinite wealth uh, content that unlocks after oh, you content, beat it. Yeah, but they also have um. The cabaret club is fully uh, FMV now, so they have all uh, they have like a bunch of like cut like 4K cutscenes, video footage of like the girls and like the way they react to you, and all the different footage of like when they receive a gift from you, and all their different reactions to all the responses that you make, you know. So that also and adds in to the in game like, they're like, I heard it's a new, a more immersive cabaret club, <laughs> and then it's the full motion video. And the game does one of the very first things you have to do with the economy network is go to a cabaret club. So the game will make sure that you see it. Uh, mm-hmm. How did you feel about it? It's it's kind of it's it's really weird. I mean, it's kind of charming because I like FMV stuff, but it's also kind of weird also because I, I've never I've never gotten used to like um, even even in FMV games like when they try to simulate like the dating element in them and you're you're they're using the first person perspective. And that's so, like when you give them a gift, it could be like Mountain Dew, 
and then so like they then you give them out to do but like the video footage is like it's it's like wrapped in a gift box oh yeah like, for me it's like do you want to give a gift and i i had only had like the the energy drinks like the potions yeah, yeah. like here have this energy drink <laughs> and then it's wrapped in a gift box it's like, oh, thank you so much for this energy drink <laughs> Right. Or it it asks you for like, what do you want to drink? And like, regardless of what you pick, you know, because they're, well, actually, I haven't tested it to see if like she'll hand you different drinks that they've like had in video clips. But it's like, here, this is, this is whiskey, I promise. (laughs) Even though you could select like sake or I don't know. I don't know. You can maybe just select like soda or seven up. It's like, here's your drink that you requested. It's very clearly the one you requested. It's it's definitely not the like, you know, the liquid color definitely does not match what you, you know, you chose. It's like the same standard drink. so i mean yeah, I, you know, that's kind of, I, didn't, that's kind of... I didn't dislike it but i i did kind of say like eh, i don't think it's an improvement i don't know how much it like the resources that went into it i don't know if it was something that they could easily do or if it was something that they put a lot of effort into i don't i don't think it buys them a lot it's like oh it's an it's FMV now. I guess that's good. Is that an improvement? A sideways and move, I guess. The, the, like FMV is not nothing new for the series because you had the live chats from Yakuza Six. Now those were FMV. Mm. You had like yeah. a few other entries that had like minor FMV elements. It's not. It's not like a new thing for the series, but it's definitely like one of the most like one of the biggest presences of FMV in like a, a side game. Yeah, it's just that I I can't say like. The cabaret club is way better now because of this. It's like you know, it's just different. It, that, that's so. like that's like, but like that, that's not really the the thing that people want from cabaret club is not really well. From what I understand, like you know, especially for me, it's like the cabaret club is like never a big feature for me. in The game is always the cabaret club management. Now that mm. that is a mini game. All right, yep. that, that's one hell of a mini game. So that that's the thing that that I I, I wish would come back because that doing doing the, those types of like management game sorts of uh mini games has uh, always been a fun aspect of the series for me and like i remember like the the business business manager from yakuza 7 that was fun and also you had the added incentive of, like oh i'll get a new party member out of it so totally be mm-hmm. ignored because she's an optional member but i'll get a new party member out of it i hope she shows up in the sequel me too and it's, yeah, just, she's great. And it's just in a way where they might play like they might nod to that it's like, don't we know this person? I don't think so. Oh, <laughs> that'd be so like sad that. if he did that. No, okay, not like that. But she's like, okay, oh, okay. Man, she's like that awesome business lady that, that we met like the uh, you know a few years back. And then, yeah, and I, th- I think well. that uh, I, that that business mini game. I hope they do s- something a lot because you know it's called Infinite Wealth, uh, mm-hmm. and so I don't know if that's gonna be part of the the, the like the thesis or the theme of the game. It was one. It was kind of you know at, at one point in Yakuza Seven. You needed so much cash if you wanted to be completionist that you ended up doing that thing over and over and got a little old. Uh, but I don't know if that's the fault of the game itself or it was just like, I want a, a mindless way to get a million yen really quickly or whatever. Yeah, it's pretty funny, right? Because like when you think about like how much time it kind of took to get a million yen in that game, if you weren't like actively engaging in like that business management game or other sources of income, it still took you some time to kind of build up one million yen. And yeah, because mm-hmm. like a dragon compared to like, and like a dragon guy dead, like how fast do you get a billion yen? <laughs> and like a dragon guy dead, it'd be it, like, uh, maybe right now where you're at, it still takes some time. But like later on, you it's like very trivial to get a million yen in that game. One of the very first things I found in like one of those random suitcases was like a gold plate, which yep. I know is only a hundred thousand, but still it's like, oh, this seems like it's just, you know, it's, it's not hard to get cash in the, in the game. Yeah. And uh, it works to its benefit because like you said earlier, the upgrades, like most of them take, you know, a Kami network points and uh, cash. Yeah, the I, I guess the, the 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 last like significant thing in this game is the Coliseum itself. The, the Coliseum mini game is very much expanded um, from previous entries. Where uh, in Yakuza Six, if you remember the Clan Creator mini game, um, where mm-hmm. you kind of yeah, you kind of build up your, your squad of people, and then you kind of put you have this overhead map. Um, perspective where you could kind of place them where you wanted them to be, but the the way that they acted, they pretty much acted on their own. Um, pretty much with like you kind of giving like orders here and there, but you didn't have like direct control over it. While in this one in the Coliseum for uh, Gaiden, you saw this clan creator where you can deploy some people to fight with you. They have like the tank class, the healer class, the DPS class, and then uh, so like. Some of like the limits will be like only up to four people uh, can uh, be with you, 
that number could go up to ten. Um, and then uh, when you go into that fight, you're you're playing, you know, Kiryu himself, like participating in that battle with all the capabilities and upgrades that you've given Kiryu in the main game. So you're fighting alongside them, and then you can give them orders once this um, meter fills to give them like a buff. But other than that, you know, they're they're pretty much fighting on their own, fulfilling their roles. Um, and and the, the weird thing also is that in, in the Colosseum, you're not confined to just controlling Kiryu always. Like when you go to like eat like that that big like clan fight or like one of the the one on one Colosseum matches, you can pick another character besides Kiryu. They give you like a character select. And like, do you want to play like this random grunt? You want to play a Tori the ninja that you recruited? Or you want to play this tank character or this healer character? Um, so you can just kind of use another playable character besides Kiryu in that mode. Um, the, but the but the downside is that they don't have the capabilities of what Kiryu has. They don't have any of the upgrades, like the health upgrades or heat upgrades that they, he has. Um, they don't have heat actions. They do have a heat meter, but it's only one bar of heat. And once it's filled, then you just activate it like like how you would do like a uh, like an overheat um, or extreme heat uh, mechanic. But instead of like you getting like a buff, um, it just depends on the role. So let's say a healer activates this, they'll get like a burst heal. If a DPS person has this, they might do like a big like powerful attack. Um, and then, like uh, a tank will like raise their defense temporarily, but and then their move set is, is extremely limited. It's not like it's not fleshed out like Kiryu and all. So it's like it's like a fun gimmick because some of them have like you know like an infinite durability web because that's part of their move set. But other than that, it's like it's just kind of like a fun novelty once in a while. But nothing. It's kind of a weird. <laughs> it's it's a, it's a very weird um inclusion that like. Having more options is nice, but I, I think there's very little incentive to play other people besides Kiryu in that. Well, it's I, I always am kind of impressed to what extent like some of the side content mini games, or that's not even a mini game. It's just like a, it's almost like a side feature uh, goes into all of these games, and and they're often like they're they're iterated on from game to game, but not in a way where it becomes repetitive. Like Clan Creator is not in every game, or shows up mm-hmm. in different fashions. Yeah. Um, I th- like as I've played through the series, there's certain games that I get very completionist in. Uh, like, I, I think I was really completionist in Yakuza 0. I picked Yakuza 5 to be completionist in, which is <laughs> what a not a good one. <laughs> uh, and then, um, so Yakuza 6, I didn't. I think Judgment, I was pretty much main path, lost Judgment. I actually did like all the school stuff, oh, yeah. which is the majority of the side content in that game. Yeah. Um, so I don't know where I'm going to fall with uh, Like a Dragon Gaiden. It's one of those things where it's like, it's a shorter game, so might as well. But also this year is insanely packed and there's other games I want to get to. So it's kind of like trying to trying to weigh that balance. Um, the one the the lost judgment like robotics club mini game was the last time i really got into like oh yeah i, I a super I, detailed i really like that, that. <laughs> yeah so uh, that was a, that was a fun one yeah i, I love that uh mini game um like series that was really yeah fun. i did the tutorial coliseum where you have like the party it's almost like well, that that other part of the series will be the turn-based RPG. This is the party-based action RPG, kind of. You're not wrong, actually. Yeah, yeah that's 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 how you like. Yeah, it's almost like a, a ima- like imagine if like you had like the RPG classes, but it's it's just a brawler instead of a turn-based. Yeah, because yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you hear you is not any uh, stranger to having allies that have helped him in combat, like uh, um, Akira Nishiki Kayama in the zero and one, yeah. uh, and then. Or zero only, I don't remember. Uh, Date, uh, the Kaoru from uh, from two. Uh, so like, I imagine a future game that is like the brawler style Yakuza, but not but full size. Only it's a party based action RPG. Just throwing it out there. This just as an option. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, that'd be pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, I, I, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll actually try to mess with the uh, that Coliseum setting uh in this game because i i had no idea you couldn't i assumed that they just like wandered around behind kiryu because in the tutorial fight i didn't try it was like oh now i've got three random because the the game basically introduces you to how you recruit people here's three people now you do one match with them introduce the idea which is which is smart of the of the studio to do to at least kind of force you to engage with the system once and then you can choose whether you want to go deeper into it similar with the cabaret club 
so yeah, maybe I'll, uh, you know, before next week, I'll, I'll poke at that a little bit before beating the game. Yeah, that, that, let me know, like, uh, like uh, what you think of the ending cutscene in this game. I really mm-hmm. want to hear from you after you beat the game what you what you thought. I will say that even though uh, it's kind of expected, one thing at the very outset of this story that's a little bit kind of, I didn't take to it immediately, was within, like, 15 minutes of starting the game multiple people are like we know who you are you're kiryu let's see how strong you really are and like really you're just a random grunt and you're gonna like you know who i am and yet you're still just saying like you're not as strong as i really say right it's like do you do you know everything i've done for the last like two decades one of my one of my, the funniest things in this game is that like in the, in the main like there are main story cutscenes that you already seen them like uh, when you, there, during that bar exchange with that uh, Omi Alliance dude the Omi Alliance dude is like uh, is like you know Kiryu we we really need your help with this it's like hold on first of all I'm not Kiryu but suppose I was Kiryu what would you have <laughs> me do <laughs> but I'm not Kiryu I'm Joryu that the man you're talking about is dead <laughs> it's, like, mm. it's so stupid. <laughs> Uh, and, but, and once they kind of get that out of the way it, it does kind of mellow out a little bit but the, the the first like 90 minutes of this game is like we know who you are we know who you are we're gonna fight you anyway even though we know who you are <laughs> and, 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 and then like carry you and like uh as hand they're like all fucking surprised pikachu face it's like oh my god they know you're cure you <laughs> what <laughs> how could that be <laughs> it's like <laughs> oh man that's it's that's it's really funny. It's so stupid. <laughs> but yeah, I think you know, I think the studio was pretty smart to very clearly frame this as like a side game. I don't really like to talk about dollars and cents because everyone's coming from a different place when it comes to that. Right. But the fact that this is a fifty dollar game, like this is gonna sound boomer of me, but I remember when you know marquee pc releases you know were 50 dollars. that's the price of a pc game and now it's like oh this this side story is 50 dollars because i just spent you know whatever 80 bucks on diablo that's that's the that's what a, a marquee pc game costs now so and you know for for some people that matters more than others but it's it's interesting that it is so close to full price despite being marketed and presented as kind of this smaller experience and I also just like you know I don't really blame people they want to skip this for eight as well because like they're they're releasing so close to each other and some people you know like mm-hmm. hey I don't really have like, the budget for this right now because especially the holiday season is coming up and I have to like think about like presents for other people as well mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. you know it, it 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 makes a lot of sense why people might like skip out on this game and like just wait for the mainline game because you know it it comes it's coming out at like a weird time where like it's on the cusp of like the the big holiday rush. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but it's like, well, uh, it's a side game. Even if you are interested in it, I've got plenty to play. I'll wait for a sale, especially right. if it's a game where you can experience the main story in 10 hours, completionist in more like 40 instead of the hundreds that it is in a, in a mainline game. I don't want to look at my Yakuza 5 playtime. It's long. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Yakuza 5. I, I'm pretty sure I hit over 100 hours. And Yakuza uh-huh. 6, I was like, nope. Main story I kept, I kept, I kept, I kept telling Brian. I, thought, I was like, Brian, don't do this with this title. Do not. Do, this shouldn't be the entry you do this with. I was like, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! No, but uh, thank you, Josh, for bouncing some uh, conversation with me back yeah. and forth about Yakuza Like a Dragon Gaiden. So, uh, a fun game, a good return to form for those that have missed this style of game. Though it kind of comes with some of the expected limitations in the way that it is kind of framed, both narratively and just. The fact that it is sort of more of a of a side side cool, be cool, but but kind of what we wanted it to be, I think. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's a, it's a very it's a very comfy game for people who like you know mm-hmm. play these like like it might be it might be not it might not be like anything like too surprising, but honestly that's fine because it's been how uh, many years since we got like a solo carry you brawler beat him up, you know, and mm-hmm. and this could very well be like the last one of those too, like. It's not, it's not out of the equation as well. It's like, this might be the last solo here, you brawler. Mm-hmm. Who knows? So the second game that we wanted to talk about that released in the last couple... I think it's already released. Uh, and that is the expansion for Tales of Arise called Beyond the Dawn. Adam, did this one origi- uh, release already? 
Yep. I always make the assumption that the embargo matches the release date because it does most of the time. But every once in a while, you get one of those classic, no, the embargo's up, but the, the thing doesn't come up for two weeks. Yeah, this is out. So, John, you can when, buy it. Sweet. Uh, so this was kind of announced earlier this year as kind of a surprise to most people uh, because I, I thought we most of us kind of, we knew that there was going to be some sort of Tales of Arise uh, production because it was trademarked, right? And but we made the guess, oh, it may be an anime adaptation. It could just be merchandise, tie in movie, something. But nope, expansion two years after the base game. Like, oh, OK, that's interesting. I wonder what this involves. So it's called Beyond the Dawn. We've gotten a few uh, trailers for it that have kind of generally touched on narratively. It takes place after the game. It kind of touches on the the two populations of people, the Donnans and the Renans getting along in this new paradigm. Uh, so this this new uh, this new young girl that kind of is somehow involved in both. So Adam, you've played through this expansion. You I think you you either re-downloaded Tales of Rise or you had never uninstalled it. But I had never uh, uninstalled what? it. So how was your time with this expansion? And just kind of tee us up in the, exactly what it is, too. Yeah, so I guess, first of all, it kind of goes without saying, I can't really talk about this expansion without spoiling Tales of Arise. So there's going to be Tales of Arise spoilers. Because it takes mm -hmm. place afterwards, so there's, there's unavoidable. So, yep. so at the end of Tales of Arise, you basically have the two planets merged together. And in Tales of Arise, if you remember... Two years ago was a long time. You had the Renans, who were basically like the upper class, and the Donans, who were basically the lower class, and they were basically subservient to the Renans and the Renan lords and whatnot. But now they're all equal. They're now living together. And so, conceptually, that's where I thought this expansion would be interesting. Not that this hasn't ever been done before. It has. But, like, okay, so now we have all these people in a new social paradigm living together on a twinned merged world, you know, how, how, how is society moving at this point? You know, what conflicts are there? What has, a, what has a, arisen pun not intended from this new paradigm? So that's where I thought, okay, this might have something interesting here in, in this concept. How, how does Nazamil, the new girl uh, play a role in this? So Nazamil, her, I'm going to do, there's going to be some minor spoilers for the expansion. I might do full spoilers later, but this is just a premise thing. Not a spoiler, really. She is half Renan, half Donnan. And that's why she has two different colored eyes. Because that's how eyes work, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the reason why she has heterochrome. Yeah, okay. That's, well. I'm assuming. Okay. <laughs> but she's half Dan Dan Donnan, half Renan. And she is the daughter of a Renan lord. She's the orphaned daughter of a Renan lord. Um but also half done in. So she doesn't really fit in anywhere because the Renans don't like her, the Donans don't like her, so she's sort of an outcast. And then early on in the expansion, like in the first 10 minutes, you stumble into her and she's basically on the run being assaulted and you save her and she tags along. And so this expansion, I remember we actually talked about it a couple of weeks ago in the lead up to the release, Bandai Namco released a Quests trailer for the expansion. And we talked about it on the podcast. We felt that was a little bit strange. Like, why are we highlighting basic quests? And like, they're the same format. The it's, same it's like how to do a quest or what yeah. is a quest. Kind yeah, of like, like a primer. it's, we, I think, I like to think a lot of people in this space are familiar with quests. And these are not especially, you know, extravagant complex, intricate quests. They're very, if you play Tales of Arise, the quests are all very kind of fetchy in nature. You talk to a person, they ask you to like defeat some enemies or collect some items, you do that and you return. I'll, I'll be honest, I'll, I think that having that sort of like micro side quest sort of system in a game itself is not, you know, that's fine. I don't think everything has to be a super elaborate story focused quest. I think it's fine to have little checklisty things, right? It just felt yeah. strange to highlight it like this is what we're going to focus on for this expansion that you can do side quests and it's just kind of like okay that's a a little bit strange uh, it's kind of a weird thing that you chose this to be a focus of your trailer but after playing the game it makes more sense because that is most of the expansion like 50 percent of it or more is doing these side quests you don't have to do them but should you choose to do them 
So what I just mentioned about, um, you know, Donnins and Renans living together, all the new main characters, they have like their own personal story. How were they, how, where have they moved on to past the events of Tales of Arise? Those show up in the quests as well. And so that's basically the side quest system is basically the framework in which they place these sort of like epilogue concepts, these epilogue questions and topics and subjects. And I just kind of felt that was strange, especially when like two things, the presentation of the quest is pretty much unchanged. If you play Tales of Arise, um, you talk to an NPC. Many of these are not voiced. It does a sort of like shot reverse shot thing where it's just kind of like very robotic, like, hi, I am a so-and-so and I need this. And then your characters might m mutter a few things and they say, okay, well, if you get these things and everything will be gravy. And so I've played and then you get the quest. 16. I know what this is like. <laughs> yeah. So it's, but, and, and then I feel like the majority of the quests, like 90% of them are either take out those zoogles. I just like saying the word zoogle. Remember zoogles? Yep. Anyways. Yeah. Take out the zoogles or collect these ingredients for me. And so, like, the the actual mechanic of the quest is pretty basic. It's just defeat some enemies that are marked on your map or just collect some items that you pick up at the collection points around the map. And then you return, and then the quest is complete. And that's it. And so, like, as one example of a quest, there's a well-meaning Donin. So Donins, again, are the lower class. And he notices there's like a settlement of Renans nearby. And he's like, I want to offer them food. Like, you know, a, a show of goodwill. Like an olive branch. Like, we're trying to live together now. You know, I'm just trying to be friendly. But of course, leaving food around causes Zoogles to appear. So you have to defeat the Zoogles. And you do that. And then basically it's like, oh, okay, well, that was kind of bad. But we're going to keep working to, to coexist in this new world. And then you get the quest done and you're done. And it's just... It, the framing of this, the whole framework is just really hollow. Like, conceptually, it's not a bad idea. Like, okay, Renans and Donans struggling to live together now. You know, they're two different classes now co coexisting. It's just the, the implementation is really kind of thin and hollow. It's just like, and that's the majority of this of this, uh, of this well, expansion. So what's like the like, main, like, core plot, like... Yes. Oh, and this is where I might objective. actually get into my more full spoilers because it's hard to discuss without it. Okay. And I think I will. So if you right. haven't played this expansion and you're not interested about hearing about spoilers, skip ahead to the next timestamp. Timestamp. Yeah, I'm, I just feel like it's a, this is a game that you've already have, would have to have gotten to the end of the end of the main game anyways to have under, any idea what I'm talking about. So I'm going to spoil a little bit further than that. So. Basically, Nazamil is half done and half Renin. In an event, in an event early in the game, she's attacked, and she uh, passed the very opening when she's also attacked. And she basically decides, "There's no place for me in this world. Humans will never stop fighting. So what I'm going to do is she stumbles across old Helganquil technology. Helganquil are the aliens, if you don't remember. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, to basically mind control everyone in the world, everyone, every single person in the world, so that they are f uh, mindless and friendly towards each other. Okay. And that's and then every there will be no more conflict. Everyone will be happy, mm -hmm. and that's it. And of course, your characters are like, well, you can't just mind control everyone and turn everyone into zombies. That's not, you know. That's not real peace. That's like a fake, sterile utopia. Um, Man, that sounds like just right straight up Tales of Viserys Endgame. <laughs> exactly, exactly. There's two comparisons I want to make. So so the spoiler is, is that you actually end up kind of in conflict with Nazamil. Even though she's like well-meaning, she wants peace, her methods are extreme. And so this, in the Tales series, this reminded me of two other plot points. One, she's basically, she's basically Mythos. From Tales of Symphonia, a half elf, where she's where Mythos's uh, goal was well, half elves are always just going to be discriminated against. In order to remove discrimination from the world, I'm going to turn everyone into lifeless beings using Crucius crystals, and then once that happens, there'll be no more discrimination. It's very similar. Or what you just said, Tales of Berseria, Artorius, um, who basically is. He lost his what wife and unborn child or his child, I don't remember exactly, to basically conflict and war. 
And he's like, in order to get rid of all the strife in the world, I need to rid the world of emotion because emotion is what causes conflict. And so, yeah, the, the yeah, the end of that game is basically everyone's turning into zombies. Sure, it's peace, but it's not really peace. And so when this plot line started forming in this expansion, I was just kind of like, man, I've already seen this. I've already in twice, at least in this very <laughs> series. And so and I'm not going to say they're exactly the same. I mean, you could easily point out like, well, Symphonia did it like this, and this expansion is a little different. I'm sure there's some differences, but just the overall broad concept of it, I'm just like, I've seen this before. It's not very interesting. Maybe it'll throw some wrench into things that's significant that'll make me feel, oh, okay, it's got a unique twist on this trope, but it doesn't really. Um, so yeah, I just kind of felt really disappointed both in the main plot line, uh, this trope, well, even basically. the main plot line, the two worlds, it's also Symphonia and also was it Destiny? No, uh, Eternia uh, is also a dual world. Eternia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also, I mean, like, even Tales of Vesperia, yeah. even Tales of Vesperia is not too far off where Duke's goal is basically uh, humans are going to destroy the world. So we need to, I need to just sterilize everything and get rid of humans. Like, okay. <laughs> it's not too far off. They should, they should do the inverse of the next Tales of game. Everyone should be zombies at first, and then they're working <laughs> towards becoming human. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Tales of Hearts, okay? Uh, Kohaku, or I think her name's... I play Tales of Hearts. I don't remember it that much. Okay, you become a zombie because you try to go through inside her heart, but you botch that, right. and then all her heart went all over the place, so you're trying to reach... Oh, yeah, you collect the five heart shards. I remember this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, what go. if Devil's Advocate... I've never played another Tales game, so I don't have this sort of, like... Pre preconceptual baggage. Based I don't on know. The... I don't know why I thought of this. Also, <laughs> you know what? Also has this basically exact same end game plot. Naruto. Um, That's the ending of Naruto. Yeah, it's basically the the, the, the world. The, the the enemy. The villain wants to basically create a zombie world where there's no there's no more conflict. Anyways, uh, so oh my god, Adam, you just reminded me of that uh person from the uh, at at Pax West in Notria, the last song person that uh, rep oh. that i did and then like i asked about the stories i did he asked me do you know the ending of naruto and i said yes <laughs> i know nothing about naruto just to hear about what, what he meant by that so <laughs> apparently the ending of naruto is sort of the setup for sort of like the setup for notria the last song that's all but I'm, I'm sure i'm sure this trope i don't I, i'm sure there's a tv tropes page for this i don't know what it's called but in my head i kind of label it like oh this is a sterile utopia plot where it's like sure <laughs> There's no more conflict and everything is peaceful, but you've also removed individuality or joy or what have you. And it's just like not not real peace. It's like a fake peace. And so if you haven't now me, I've played every English Tales game. I'm still I'm still working through some of the Japanese only ones. Um, so I kind of caught like, oh, this is basically the same as Symphonia. It's basically the same as uh, the end of Berseria. Um, maybe if you hadn't seen those before, this would seem like interesting or new. Cause like when you, when you're, when you're battling an antagonist, when Nazmiel is your antagonist, it does sort of have like, you don't actually hate her. She's not vile. You just want to basically stop her from doing something that is damaging. So it's like, maybe like there's a little bit of that sort of compassion or sympathy for an antagonist in this game, in this, uh, in this expansion, but still it's like, I've kind of seen this before while meaning. I, 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 think, I, so. I think the thing that confuses me is like, what do you do? And like in the, in the main plot to get up to that point? Cause I've, I, we know the end goal is to stop Nazamil from this uh, mind controlling plot, but it's like the main plot is just like, you go observe like what, I, like, and there'll be like some minor conflicts that arise in this new combined world now. Yes. Uh, but okay. Then, okay. Basically. <laughs> you right. So, yeah, those side quests I mentioned earlier, that's a big component of the game. And some of them are sort of like a main quest for, or a side quest framed as a main quest. Like you have to do this, explore over oh. here and kill some Zoogles. So it's just kind of like, you're, it's, it's, it's supposed, it starts out lower stakes where it's like, you know, minor conflicts. The world is relatively peaceful. Um, and so you're just kind of dealing with these sort of errand boy conflicts sort of thing. But it's just like I, I like I already said, the framework of it is just a little bit hollow. 
Um, and, and, and there's already there's already like a little weird too, like even from a gameplay perspective, because it seems like, like from what I understand, there's no new playable yes, characters. That was my there's, next point. Yeah. Okay. Go. So for like, it. even if some of the story stuff or questing stuff wasn't exactly what I was looking for, like maybe there's some interesting gameplay wrinkle or something new, something that makes this expansion feel unique. But it plays exactly the same as the main game. It's no different. Um, at all. Are the bosses like, uh, better at least? I mean I actually felt like the the boss was a little bit better, not as much of a HP sponge as some of the bosses in the game. But maybe. Um but still I felt like so when I think about expansions like this, there's a couple that come to mind. Um if I think outside of the series, I think like, okay, all three Xenoblade games had an expansion, like the new version of one, Torna and three they all have an expansion and they introduce a new characters or like a new a take on the combat system like torna doesn't play exactly like xenoblade 2 it's a little bit different in how the blades and drivers work you play as the blades right uh, yeah and it's i remember it being a little bit different in terms of how you like switch between the two in in the pacing and whatnot and what and and like those make those expansions kind of feel unique like if you just ignore plot ignore story or things like that they just feel different to play they kind of feel like a different take on the game they're built differently but here it's like the exact same it's more and even if i try to compare it within the series i can think of a, a few ex examples um this wasn't necessarily a dlc but the re-release of tales of graces f which is the one we actually got in english it added a new arc similarly it adds a new arc it's not a dlc because it's in the expansion it's in the re-release it was called Lineage and Legacies, I believe, something like that. And it added the Excel mode meter. And there was a whole mechanic tied to this, including a new mystic art for each character. So no new character, but like it kind of, the, the way we phrased this before, it like added a verb to the, to the combat, like a new wrinkle in things, like it added to it, it layered to it. And like, okay, this feels different, it's new. Or I, I think this game is the worst Tales game I've played, Tales of Zestiria. I don't like Tales of Zestiria. I'm really sorry, Zestiria fans. I think it's bad. Um, it added an. It had a DLC. This is sort of a silly one. That this DLC's selling point was it added Alicia back. So right, I remember this. I wrote a review about that game. I gave it a six out of ten, but not not with RPG site though. I wrote it on <laughs> Yeah. I like but anyways, that that DLC is sort of silly because they you you get a Alicia for like part of the game and then she's removed and this is sort of like here you can have her back but at least it sort of felt different like oh, okay i have a new character i am playing with with new moves and mechanics and whatnot you know it just kind of felt different than the end game of zestiria um although that dlc was also very bad do you remember those cauldrons and that dlc was basically just a bunch of cauldrons which are those yeah like, we were talking about battles. that the other week yeah it's just like the wave based yeah, yeah it's it's, almost like a anyways mode. but my point is is that at least both of those tales examples one of them being literally a dlc and one of them being more like a re-release edition both had like a new system in play or a new character you know something that felt different and even like even like fire emblem recent fire emblem games have expansions that maybe not be great but they add like different characters or different maps or different you know classes or units or styles but this expansion just has no differences it's the same so it has like that that one new dungeon yes yeah i guess there's there's actually sort of like two new dungeons but the first one which you play relatively early is very simple but at the end there's a final dungeon in this game that is kind of cool like it's got kind of a cool style and aesthetic to it but if you really boil it down, like most Tales of Arise dungeons, it's really just a battle corridor. There's not really much in the way of puzzles. It's more of just working your way around the path. You know, you, we have to like defeat mini bosses to unlock doors. But um, my my point here is is that the Tale series hasn't really had decent dungeon design since like the Graces Vesperia era. Sorry. Um, <laughs> That's yeah. I'm thinking like yeah. It, 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 yeah. They bottomed out with Brazaria, and then they yeah, got like slightly better since. Zillia's had really... like straight paths and repeated open worlds. And Brazaria is a game I actually really like. Brazaria yes. is a game that I'd say it is a good game that I recommend playing. The only drawback is that its dungeon design is not great. 
I, that's a main drawback. Five, so, <laughs> I, t- I, t- I tell people to, like the, the the thing that you'll struggle with, with most in Berseria is like not falling asleep like as you explore around dungeons. Yes. <laughs> so, so, but well, Tales of Arise's dungeons, if you played them, they're not really like. When I think of dungeons, I still think of like Symphonia, which Symphonia had a lot of like puzzles, a lot of some block pushing, some door opening. Uh, some of those dungeons went overboard. Escort, like escorting the, the shadows. Yeah, the, the shadows. They, that was actually better in the PS3 re-release. I don't know about the newest re-release. And then you saw how watered down they could de- uh, get. Yeah, and the they've world. kind of gone the exact opposite, where there's like no dungeon gimmicks at all. It's pretty much just like open your map and follow the path. So that that's the, so there is a final but, dungeon, but it's really just that again. Um, the, the the one like dungeon I remember from like a rise like is like manipulating the elevator, and that's it. <laughs> Oh yeah, like there's like a there's like an elevator. Yeah, elevator you, you go to different floors and you like yeah, yeah. That's all I remember from so the slightly dungeon. better. But yeah, anyways. So when I came to like when I came to a when I approached this review, um, when I well first of all I'll mention I'll put it this way. Uh, when we shared my score, I gave it a six out of ten. Um, which six out of ten to me, I've said this a couple weeks ago, is like, it's not broken. It's not bad. If you like the combat, if you like the characters of Tales of Arise, there's a lot more skits between characters. The combat, like I said, is unchanged. So if you like it, it's more of it. And like the story isn't like necessarily poorly told. I just kind of felt like it's overdone. So I kind of felt like it's a disappointing expansion. But if you're a really big fan of the game, you'll probably still enjoy it in some sense. Now, again, there's that whole dollars element to it. Like, is this worth thirty dollars? Not sure. I should mention that uh, they they advertise this as being twenty hours long. I beat it in thirteen, and that's including all doing all the side quests. That's including finding all the chests and whatnot. So it's you know I was pretty completionist on it, and I beat it in thirteen, fourteen. So uh, and that's and that's not new. Like I mean, I'm just know. I'm just saying for information's sake. Like if you're wondering how long oh, is yes. this, it's that. Um, but anyways, uh, so when I didn't hate Tales of Arise. Some people saw when we scored this, they're like, you just bashed this game anyway. And it's like, that's not really true. Um, I I thought Tales of Arise was fine. I don't hate it. It's not as Zestiria. Sorry, Zestiria fans. It's not my favorite either. I just felt it was fine. It was okay. It had strong suits. It had weak parts. And I was curious about the expansion. And that's really the reason why I review anything is because I'm curious about it. Not necessarily when we review something, are we always like, hell yeah, I'm hyped. I'm so hyped for this, you know? So I was just curious and I wanted well, I to try it. I think for Arise, <laughs> working against it is that, you know, Tales up until that point had been basically an annualized franchise. And it right. was kind of like junk food and i say that without really much judgment it was like you know what you're gonna get it's a tales game it's got a very like well-worn pattern of well-worn you know it, it's tropey in a way that you know it's comfort comfort food and then arise you know we had was it was it berseria was and then we had kind of we had some mobile projects and some other things uh and then it was you know arise was announced at an xbox conference in like 2018 or so and then it went dark for a while like we hadn't seen it and it was like what can a Tales game be? Yeah, so like, Berseria and, released yeah. in 2017, I believe, in the West, because that was delayed. And then Arise, and then Arise was and then 2021. Arise 2021. So like three, four years was a long time. And I think I think this is kind of your point, where Arise still kind of has that junk food feel in a way, despite being like much higher, I guess, presentation values. But like mm-hmm. it's, in a sense, not... With much judgment, it is a Tales game. <laughs> but yeah, you, and you might does say, have more like, scrutiny. Well, exactly what I want. So why? Yeah. Right. So yeah, I do think it just inherently got a little bit more scrutiny because of the way it was announced to the world. The, the, the series had gone dormant before it released. Uh, it was more more marketed as kind of like a a reimagining of the franchise, and then it didn't, it didn't end up quite being that. And that's not 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 necessarily a bad thing it's like oh okay it's it's it, this is what tales is and just kind of a reminder of that i and think I, for me like beyond the dawn is probably something i will play but maybe like once we know what the next main tales project is because it seems like we don't know this for sure is that this is kind of a tie over like uh, a sub team worked on this 
because they had some unfinished ideas or some things they wanted to explore while the main team ostensibly is working on whatever the next main project is. And I haven't like scoured glass door listings or whatever to, to really go into any more detail than that. And if that's kind of what this is, just like here, here's just a little kind of a, a, an addendum, a little extra. It's like, oh, okay, that's, that's, then, that, then that's fine. You know, once, once we announce the next Tales game, maybe I'll, I'll boot this up and just kind of remind myself, all right, let me see what this, what we had going for Tales of Arise here. That's the way I'm going to look at it. Anyways, I kind of got distracted in my own rambling. But like okay, when I approached this DLC and I approached my review of it, I basically stated up front, like, you know, I was curious about this DLC and I went into it with good faith. <laughs> Some people are saying I had bad faith. Like, no, I was curious. I was genuinely curious. Um, but yeah, like the side quest, like uh, framing to all the, you know, these epilogue kind of topics. The main plot line kind of feeling like he's been done before, that there's no new wrinkles in combat or gameplay, not even little ones, like there's no new arts or anything. Um, I just kind of felt it is just, in a sense, more Tales of Arise, and I wished it was more than that. So that's it. <laughs> I think that's right. crazy referring to me, because it seems like I'm always talking about a product that I like really initially, that I dislike it later, because after seeing the full product, there's certain things that probably it'll tick me off and that's probably referring to me but you know they gotta look at it you know the reviewer whoever reviewed it was a completely different person the guy that reviewed you know tales of rise was scott white you know? yeah scott was really high on the game he gave it a nine and his opinion is, is as valid as anyone's you know he really liked it he's really looking forward to the dlc i think i think he would play it but he's got another uh uh assignment he's got another <laughs> review yeah yeah, yeah. so Actually, I think he's already done the preview. He's reviewing Super Mario, so he's he's doing that right now. So he posted a preview for that this week. But um, but yeah, that's that's uh, the expansion. Um, I'm trying not to sound too like critical, like I just hate it. But you know, it was just a bit disappointing to me. Nope, and that's valid. They got, the only thing that we can ask is that we're honest. We're not just gonna pretend to like it more than we did or bang, bag on it more than we think it deserves. It's just just pure honesty. Now, so we kind of have. I want to point out one oh, more thing ahead. that's just sort of fun. Sorry. Okay. Um, no worries. So, I don't know if we talked about this on the podcast or not, but I remember we recently hit, like this summer, the two year anniversary of Scarlet Nexus. And because yeah. that came out just shortly before Arise, right? And um, so, the yeah. producer of that, Kenji Anabuki, basically said. Um, that a sequel is not in the works right now. He wants it, but it doesn't seem like it's happening. Um, but he's been we back also on want it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we also uh, want it. And, um, but he, he's back on the tales team. He mentioned, uh, I'm don't, don't quote me, but he like implied that he's working on tales. His, his name is actually in the credits of this expansion. Uh, not as like a lead or really any important role, but it's sort of an amusing one. So this expansion, in a way, kind of brings back that Tails kind of running gag of, like, poorly drawn uh, portraits. And yeah. he's in the credits, Kenji Anabuki, the producer of Scarlet Nexus, as the one who drew those, <laughs> which is sort of fun. Go goofy portrait artist. Uh, I think it says Sketches of Our Friends is what the role is called. And I think oh, he, I think, I think he, uh, I think he kind of did some weird, fun, goofy Scarlet Nexus sketch fan art too of that style but yeah i just thought that was sort of amusing to find his name in the credits not as like the producer or the lead or writer or anything he's just like i wrote i do this goofy portraits it's fun man there should be another scarlet nexus well thank you adam for talking about your time with tales of arise beyond the dawn so i kind of see these two games that because i like a dragon uh, Gaiden and Beyond the Dawn, they're, they're kind of very different games, but similar sort of experience in terms of like their scope and what people are expecting out of them as kind of like holdovers for the next main thing. So hoping to put time into both of these before the end of the year. Uh, and we have some games that we talked about, like Super Mario RPG coming out next week and a few other releases for November uh, as we kind of lead up into our end of the year discussions. I think those are the only two titles that we had earmarked to talk about this week. Unless Josh or James wanted to talk to any length about uh, Risk of Rain Returns. 
Um, yeah, we can talk about it a little. Uh, that, that's okay. Yeah, there's, there's a game that uh, uh, James and I have been really, really excited for. There's basically uh, a, a remake of, uh, of Risk of Rain 1, which released, goddamn, it was like a, a, very, a very long time ago. Was it like nine, eight, nine years? Or was it a little less than that? What the original release date for Risk I'm of Googling Rain 1 was? I'm Googling it right now. Yeah. It's been, it's been a while. And and I know Risk of Rain didn't really get, become super popular it, until Risk of Rain it, too. It released a decade ago. This was oh. a ten year anniversary project. God, <laughs> it was already ten years. Um, so uh, I guess uh, Risk of Rain. I I know I talked about it a very 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 old podcast episode, but to pretty much sum it up, Risk of Rain one, uh, and and even two. Uh, are both roguelikes where you choose a character, you level up, you have a, a, a like a set pre- a preload of like skills on your characters, and the main gimmick in this roguelike is that the game gets harder the longer a run goes. So you start, uh, there, it's a series of five stages, and the the, the longer you kind of spend in a run, um, difficulty will go up. The difficulty is noted at the top right corner of like a meter very slowly filling up with, uh, as, as time goes on so it'll start with like very easy to easy to medium to hard to insane to other impossible and all sorts of difficulties and it's all dictated by just simply how long the run is going and the the goal of each stage is pretty simple um for your main objective in a, in a given stage is you find this device called a teleporter, um, you activate it, and you have to survive for 90 seconds to as that t- teleporter is booting up, and you have to go beat a boss that spawns, uh, and and then you go to the teleporter to the next stage. Along the way, as you're exploring this level, you'll be able to like do some platforming, climbing up ropes, uh, uh, picking up chests, um, if you can afford them with like the currency that you get in as you beat up enemies and like open boxes or containers um and, and it's all within the framework once again of like very uh different characters some are like, specialized like in support like putting down entries of engineer some can like uh shoot like a, a bow and arrow with a huntress and she can um you know throw a boomerang that'll bounce off uh nearby enemies you have your standard commando that is has like dual pistols and is uh very good at like kind of putting on like dps pressure and hit stun uh, on um, like medium range enemies, you have a sniper that is uh, specializes in very long shots and stacking up critical chances for like that one big shot, um, and so on and so forth. And uh, the, and a risk of rain returns is uh, that original concept, but in a much much more bigger fashion. In the sense that they added more characters, you now have like these challenge trials called providence trials which are like kind of like challenge stages that give you different like alternative skills uh for some of the characters and it's like skins like cosmetic like colors uh to them and also um kind of like one of the one of the biggest uh overhauls to the game is that you can now just seamlessly play with other people in multiplayer because originally you had to do some port forwarding and all that fun nonsense uh, when uh, network infrastructure and uh, multiplayer games still was it wasn't as standardized or streamlined or as easy as today um so that that that's easy now and and you know this this takes into account a lot of like accessibility features that have been more more, more prominent in games with different um sorts of um uh, control styles uh, inherently supports controllers now it uh like has accessibility features like player outlines how how zoomed in do you want the game to be um and all sorts of that and even even like in um multiplayer you can set it so like uh each person can decide like what difficulty they want to be on like say one player wants to really challenge themselves and goes to like the the hard monsoon difficulty while another player just like hey i don't want monsoon so they can uh, set like normal difficulty for them and they can still play in the same session just fine like that so uh it's it's been and they, and they backported of, some of the additions from the second game right into the yes. first right yeah so you have uh 
features like category chests, which are basically colored chests, and they limit the pool of items that can like uh, pop up. And then like it can be a, a utility item or like a support item um, from those like uh, some of the category chests that were introduced in Risk of Rain Two. Um, all of the mountains uh, from Risk of Rain Two are basically like these little shrines that you can tap on to um modify the incoming boss in a way where like more of the boss might spawn or might have like a different suffix that like gives it different modifiers so like the and then in 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 return you might get like a better drop or multiple drops because more of them spawn uh if you do like these call of the mouth so little stuff like that too that are smart additions to this game but that, that doesn't really ruin the spirit or the or the feel of Risk of Rain 1, because the main difference from Risk of Rain 1 to Risk of Rain 2 um, is, like, aside from system changes, the, the immediate big change is the perspective where Risk of Rain 1 is all fully 2D, uh, pixel-based, and it's it's very, very zoomed out um, because you're trying to see, like, you're trying to find stuff throughout the stage from this 2D perspective, while in Risk of Rain 2, it was a fully 3D uh, version of it, it's over uh, behind the uh, third person behind the character perspective, and it's uh, obviously its level design is much more, you know, kind of fully fleshed out to uh, account for the three D uh, change of perspective. Perspective Risk of Rain two, while in Risk of Rain one, it's very much like platforming uh, stages and uh, maneuvering around it uh, as you're trying to find the teleporter in that. But yeah, it's a. I've been having a blast. It's an. It's been just kind of like a bit bigger and better and a more improved version for one. One of like, one of my favorite games. Like, um, I don't know if ever, but definitely a game that like I played again and again and again, uh, many many years ago. Like I have like easily like like over eighty hours in the first one. It just hooked me in a way that not a lot of like games of that type did. I guess. Uh, what do you think, James, on this on this Risk of Rain Returns? I mean, it pretty much seamlessly replaces the original. Mm -hmm. Don't think there's any reason necessarily if you if you haven't played Risk of Rain one and you wanted to play one version of it, there's no reason not to play Returns because you even have options to turn off all the new shit if you want to see how it was like originally. Mm -hmm. So, but with the quality of life, like the network features that Josh talked about and things like yep. that, yeah. So it's just it's like there's like a lot of really cool like touches uh, on it like at the at the ending credits when you beat a run it'll show you like a, a compare contrast between like the old uh, pixel sprites to like compared to like the new one for enemies the logbook the bestiary uh, that you uh, c can collect from enemies they all have like uh, like way better like artwork in them like like new and improved and like just full like better all around um, there's a there's a fun little twist to like the final boss. <laughs> in the game now that wasn't in the original version um and yeah it's just it's just a, a lot more and i know i'm gonna get a, a ton of hours out of it again um you know but it, it's a it's a very good the, the reason i got like so much gameplay time in the first one wasn't because of like long gameplay sessions because it was a very easy pick up and play game like hey i want to play something for like i don't know like 20 25 minutes like risk of rain run was always a good game just to like pick up, play, and have a good time. Whether it's so I watched you and Josh play a little bit of it, and it does seem like the sort of like I've yeah, got thirty game. minutes to kill. Let me do a couple runs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's a uh, it's the, 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 I guess that's just my the, the, the little other thing I've been playing besides like a Dragon Guy Den. It's like hey, this really fucking fantastic game. <laughs> a re-release of a game came out, and if you if you're interested in it, it uh, it's pretty damn. Uh, affordable it's like 13 bucks in its first week uh well worth the price because you're gonna if if, it, if you get hooked, hooked onto it it's you're gonna get a lot of hours out of it well thanks josh and james for covering uh the release of risk of rain returns not in our normal wheelhouse but i know something that other people who have been interested in playing it very sneakily high popular game in terms of how many people have played it on steam i know you and jo jo uh, sorry you and james were talking about like it's concurrent player numbers versus the original and it's let me see here the original packed uh peaked out at like 5000 concurrent risk of range returns steam charts let's see 
Oh yeah, this is this is uh, forty five thousand. So yeah, like yeah. tenfold what the original yeah. did. It's it's uh, okay. doing gangbusters. Yeah, and that that it's also that also helps us because like Risk of Rain two was mega popular. And that that a lot of that popularity seems to have you know, uh, come over well. Well, with those three in the books, we'll go into the news. Well, b- before we go into the news, one final shout out that the two games that we did talk about early in this podcast, uh, Like a Dragon Gaiden and Tales of Arise Beyond the Dawn, uh, written reviews for both of those by Josh and Adam, respectively, are up on the site at rpgsite.net. So if you've listened to this podcast, you've kind of heard their takes, but if you want to see it in written form or formalized, it's up there on the website as well. Not a lot of major headlines for this week, but we'll go into the couple things that were announced. Uh, of course, November 7th is N7 Day, which is always the day that uh, fans are eagerly anticipating to have meaty real news regarding the untitled next Mass Effect project. And we did get a little bit of a tease from N7 Day 2023 for the next Mass Effect project. Uh, the result, as you go to the website now, is a little 30 second teaser showing a character in like an N7 branded trench coat walking down a hallway. Now, Adam, apparently, like the way this was actually put together on November 7th was a little bit more intricate. Uh, than they that. released like three mini, mini teasers that were like six, seven seconds long. And then at the end of the day, they put them together for a 30 second teaser, which is what, which is what we shared on our post. So unfortunately, I'm not like like I have I've played all the Mass Effects, including Andromeda. But like in here, like I haven't scoured this to do like where is this character walking in? Do we know this location? Yeah, do I, we have I, surmises of who this character might like, be? I am interested in Mass pieces? Effect, but I'm not interested enough to like try to like speculate like tiny minute details based on like the color of the sole of his shoes or something. You know, um, <laughs> so like it's a character in like a trench coat with like a helmet. And they also sent out like a render of this character. Um, And I know in the render, like in this artwork of this character, um, it has like like a superimposed scene kind of uh, on the on the artwork on like the cape or on like on the coat part of the trench coat that shows just like some concept art. And the only thing I know from that that people pointed out is that it has aliens from both the main series and from Andromeda shown there. Which I don't know if that's super surprising, but it's like okay, they're not just forgetting Andromeda never existed or which, anything like that. Which is good, yeah. They're they're gonna they're gonna own it and like incorporate it into the larger universe. One yeah. thing that surprised me of this, I think this is kind of a like I don't know I don't know if COVID's to blame or what, but that original teaser trailer, I'm like, yeah, that was like that was like a year ago, right? It's like, nope, that was 2020. Like since yeah. then, we got the in 2022, we got the concept art with like the mass relay. In 2021, we got like that movie poster of like the crash ship near a crater. Yeah, and the crater looked like uh, a gas. And yeah, and then it's like, oh, like that original trailer is 2020. So it's been very piecemeal. Ostensibly, Bioware is working on um, Dragon Age Dreadwolf primary team with a secondary team on Mass Effect. But neither one we've seen. We we talked about Dreadwolf earlier this year, where they announced the logo and the subtitle without any. What's sort of funny anything. is that these teases of Mass Effect, whether or not they are representative of the game itself, remains to be seen. But it's actually like a rendered character animated and doing something. Where in Dragon Age we haven't we don't we we haven't even gotten that. It's it's been like concept art still shot sort of things like we haven't really even got a teaser trailer sort of funny Mm -hmm. so we're kind of in the same like so one another n7 day is come and gone something for fans to to chew on but still kind of in in a general sense the same place we were beforehand yeah it's it's hard to it's hard to get really you know looking forward to anything like anytime these types of sorts of teasers pop like we have a logo we have a piece of new art it's like is there a game? It's like, mm, check back in like five years and maybe it's like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> you know, like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> you know? I, I think it's something to get over, get hype about because, you know, they haven't seen a Mass Effect since the third one. You know, you know, you know what, you know what gets me excited, Chow? 
Uh, video games, the, the the video game part of the video game. <laughs> oh, I I went and played the first one because I never played a Mass Effect game before. Okay. Uh, I mean that's great. I mean yeah, the first Mass Effect, my the first Mass Effect is my favorite Mass Effect. I, 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 playing, I, I feel like this is a far better Starfield. <laughs> okay, you're playing you're playing the le- you're playing the legendary edition. I, I'm talking about the original Mass Effect one is my favorite Mass Effect. Yeah, I'll just play the legendary edition. I, I, because this game's been out before, so I, I mean, I mean, like the legendary, the legendary edition of Mass Effect one is very is different from the original Mass Effect. Is it that much different? Yes, I, I'm, a, I'm completely new to this. It's pretty, it's pretty much a remade game, gameplay wise. So. But yeah, I was playing it, and I chose to be a complete scum. I, I pick all the douchebag options there. Okay, so you're right. Hey, that's actually in in <laughs> Mass Effect is a fun game to be. To be yeah, a douche. Mm-hmm. So like, why are you hiding that box? Renegade, <laughs> Renegade Rat is funny in Mass Effect. So, but uh, yeah. this, uh, <laughs> of course, uh, we should mention. Like, obviously, this is coming not long after the announcement of layoffs. At I believe it was like September time frame of like fifty senior staff. Yeah, uh, yeah. and some of which I remember seeing in social media. Uh, they they laid off people who have been like uh, uh, writing on the original Dragon Age game on Origins. Uh, they let go of a gentleman named Lucas Christensen, who had apparently written for Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, uh, and had been, according to social media reports, um, like referred to internally as like old man Luke, and sort of kind of like, kind of kind of a, an institution in a way, been there forever, was probably going to retire there, seemingly was let go of, and just kind of, and when Alongside all the news of other studios, it's kind of been like a repeated theme throughout the back half of this year. Um, not only for game developers, but game, you know, yeah, fan sites and um, media sites as well. Yeah, industry Kotaku in general. Just also, yeah, I guess that's a good way to put it. And just Bioware, just in the soup of all of those news, did lay off 50 men, uh, 50 people, men and women, just a couple months ago ahead of this teaser. So... Again, hard to know exactly what the future holds. We're kind of in the same boat we were prior to to N seven day, but there is a new teaser trailer uh, for whatever excitement that. Brings. What's the teaser next year? What's next year's November seven? Uh, we'll get a named character. Ooh, all right. I might be optimistic, but that's as far I'm going to go. <laughs> I thought that, I know, that's that's pretty That's pretty. Boring. And of course, we we of course hope that all the people who did were let go do land on their feet. Yeah. Uh, for everyone in the industry it's like it's like that's kind of uh, every week it's just like it's another round of layoffs somewhere in the industry really mm. sucks <laughs> really sucks we also do have a few other gameplay trailers for some smaller scope titles uh coming out in december we do have another dragon quest spin-off title and that is the dragon quest monsters the dark prince and this is a you featuring a character from Dragon Quest Three, which I have not played, so or, I can't really uh, speak Dragon to it Quest in terms of like the pro four. I, I did. I did. I make this mistake last week or two weeks ago. Uh, anyway, probably. <laughs> uh, I probably did. Uh, so we we got a trailer that is basically a gameplay introduction trailer where they have kind of like a Disney Disney esque narrator talking about like what you will see and do in Dragon Quest Monsters: The Dark Prince, um, and me who have played some of the more recent Grand Quest titles, including Treasures, but haven't really clearly been <laughs> not, not a huge series fan. I look at this and my initial reaction is that it just seems to occupy a very similar space as like Dragon Quest Treasures in that it ties into an existing mainline series entry in Treasures it's 11 and this one it's 4 in a monster focused like side game where the key gameplay component is building up a team in order to uh, interface with the whatever the goal of the game is. And having only played Dragon Quest Treasures a couple of months ago, I just kind of feel like a little bit crowded, like, oh, it's it's a similar scoped game. And I don't know if that's fair, but that's kind of my initial gut when I when I look at, oh, yeah, this game's coming out next month. I'll probably and also the fact that it's this is currently just like Treasures was announced as Switch exclusive, likely coming out on other consoles or PC in probably six to seven months' time. Not not announced, but that's just where the precedent's been set. We're so obviously the uh, next Dragon Quest are like mainline RPG or those HD 2D, that it, three HD 2D thing. That's not, I guess that's a bit, big way to sum it up. It's like, well, it's great and all, but when's the next main, main Dragon Quest thing? Because that's what people are really, you know, really, really want. 
But I, and I, as someone who's played Dragon Quest Four, do you like how excited are you for the Dark Prince? I mean, it looks sort of like I've never played a Dragon Quest Monsters. Um. It looks sort of like Dragon Quest Pokemon, you know, you summon yeah, different much, monsters. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. so I'll probably play it, but if you know me, I'll wait for a <laughs> PC port. That's where I'm at now too, dude. Like it's it's gonna come, you know, sometime next year, probably. I mean likely. it feels like for a lot of months. this stuff. Yeah, six months yeah. almost exactly is six or seven months is when is how long it takes. Yeah. And it, it'll be shadow drop too, so we won't. Yeah, know. Dragon Quest That's Treasures, right. they just are like, it's out now, like, oh okay. I thought you better, you better earmark like the six month uh, anniversary from this the, this release date, and then now you know the release mm-hmm. date of the PC port, so you won't you won't be shadow dropped again. Dragon Quest Treasures Steam charts. I'm just curious. Five hundred sixty <laughs> player peak. All right. Hell yeah. But yeah, um, so I I know some people like even on staff, uh, Colin has been really excited for this game and has been uh, curious to see when they're going to start marketing. One of this. our newer staffers, Junior, is like the biggest Dragon Quest nut we have on staff. So mm-hmm. we got to yeah. get some of these Dragon Quest nuts on podcast to, to balance out our. Boomer hey, game. I've played all the mainline uh, games. Me too. What the fuck? And I played. You liked all the mainline monsters. games. I like most of them. <laughs> I like okay the only okay, main okay. Monster, okay I I didn't okay. play ten okay to be fair I didn't play ten junior, really play, have... junior plays ten yeah he plays ten he yeah. plays everything uh, I mean he, he, he he's in Japan he can he can play ten all right <laughs> um, who, who is lined up to review this just curious Colin you yeah. know Colin yeah. all right yeah but I Colin mean, will give it a fair shake I I, like, I, I would ones. we always give it a fair shake all of our reviews are fair. Are you saying that it's bad faith again? Are, are, are you saying are you saying that RPG site, the outlet that's given Dragon Quest XI three ten out of tens, is not going to give a Dragon Quest game a fair shake? Fucked up, touche. But yeah, if you if you've heard about Dragon Quest Monsters announced, but you're not quite sure how it plays, the new gameplay overview basically goes into it in pretty. Pretty clear detail about exactly what you'll be doing. In that There's game. a demo. And it's coming out Twitch. early in December. Oh yeah, and the December and the demo has like it carries over like some bestiary type stuff. It carries wasn't over the monsters already, that you recruit. Wasn't there right. already a demo? Yeah, yeah. That's what they're referring about. to is that existing yeah. demo. Yes. Mm. And th- this trailer just reminds you play the demo now. You know it's still available. So eShop only, of course, for the time being. Yeah, we keep talking about the, P- the supposed PC version. <laughs> that doesn't exist yet. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, the PC version is not announced. We are just making an educated guest. It's a secret uh, between another... us and all of you, okay? Don't tell Square Enix that there's probably a PC version that's, that's going to exist. And then the other game that uh, has a new gameplay trailer. I remember Adam wasn't even sure he would cover this. It's the first time, or I guess it's the second, the second time we cover this game. It is a racing RPG called Resistor that has like a cell shaded, uh, like 2000s era anime art style. And I watched the gameplay trailer for this, but in the trailer itself shows like it does some character interactions. It shows a lot of gameplay of like the, um, kind of like arcade racer-esque components to it. The the trailer itself doesn't give away anything that suggests RPG-ish. Yeah, so this game called Resistor, um, right front and center of their like announcement press releases and even in the trailers, they're like they're calling it a car RPG or a car PG. Ah, ha ha, I get it. Um, and like we cover the announcement and then when they show the gameplay trailer, just it's... I'm not sure what part of the RPG Arcade they're like, really trying to like emphasize. Like, there's like characters and story, so it's like a narrative-driven racing game. But I don't know about like progression or mechanics or like customization or anything like that. Um, but well, I we just keep posted... getting lied to. Okay, like uh, <laughs> it's like it's like little goody two shoes when they front when the initial announcement they said RPG and then announcement. Not really. And then the, <laughs> the second is... yeah, the second. <laughs> See, this is where we're at as a genre site, guys. Like, we can only we only cover RPGs, but sometimes we just have to trust publishers. They have the same definition we do. And like, yeah, they keep saying RPG. It's like, okay, well, they said it's RPG, so I guess we cover it. And then the very next day, it's like, it's not really RPG. It's like, what the fuck did we do then? Yeah. It's, but also, but also, we don't have a lot to go like on. Implied, like, there's also like this almost like implied well it's not an rpg so therefore we don't like it as much like no this game looks really colorful the character interaction and the starting cutscene seems pretty fun and it looks really fluid and fast like it seems like it could be a really really fun game so independent of what it is or isn't 
you know what the fucking car PG? Call. Racing Lagoon. That's a car PG. All right. Yeah, that's a I, classic Square Enix title that nobody's heard of. I've heard, heard of it. Uh, I just haven't played it. It, it. it recently got an English patch, so that's why it's kind of almost relevant again. But yeah. But yeah, we have the gameplay trailer for Resistor up on the site. It's coming out on PC and all consoles, including Switch. Uh, presumably next year, but no official date. Even a year has been announced just yet. Correct. If you okay, if you're listening and you have control over this, but if your game is not an RPG, don't tell us it's an RPG. <laughs> and if it is, then don't let us know if it's actually an RPG. That's all we ask. And that's it for gameplay trailers. We have two kind of more general gaming announcements here before we go into like some sales updates and releases. Is that well? I guess this one actually, you know, we we cover this series on the site. That's the Legend of Zelda. You know, it's an RPG, eh, kind of. Um, <laughs> we we reviewed we reviewed Tears of the Kingdom. So. Yeah, we we well, we cover these games. I remember our discussions like, do we cover Breath of the Wild? And then I was like, I'll just tell you, like, it's it's the closest, it's the most RPG Zelda has been. So we're covering Breath of the Wild. I'm trying. Right? Not, not I'm trying to remember. It. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> Yeah, no, I did. I actually reviewed uh, Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition for us. It was like one of my first reviews, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. It, it's uh, we we break our own rules here. If you're going to criticize us for being inconsistent, we know. <laughs> we know. We get it. We get it. But, but anyways, yeah. uh, the long it. rumored. Yeah, the long rumored. I don't know. Different people want or don't want this. The announcement of a Legend of Zelda live action film. So going to be produced by Avi Arad. I'm not a film buff, so these names are kind of new to me. Going to be produced with Avi Arad, who is a producer on a lot of the more recent Spider-Man movies, including uh, at least one of the Spider-Verse movies. I'm not sure if on both of them. Uh, and then the the, the new Marvel um, Spider-Man trio of movies he's a producer on, as well, as well as a few other movies. And then the director is going to be Wes Ball, who has kind of a, a much more limited history of filmography, but has been director on like the uh, Maze Runner movies. And then the film is going to be co-produced by uh, both Nintendo and Sony. So it's going to be more than 50% 50% financed by Nintendo with Sony Pictures Entertainment doing the theatrical distribution. So this is apparently something Some people are really works. tripped up on that part. Like how can Sony and with Nintendo work together? It's like Sony oh, Pictures stupid. is like its own thing. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. There's different from Sony Sony's and a, PlayStation. Sony's okay? a fucking big ass company, dude. There's like how many fucking divisions in Sony to handle different parts? Come on. But yeah, I saw some a lot of people that are like PlayStation and Nintendo working together, and it's like, no, not really. Uh, <laughs> uh, people, please. this is a tangent, but I did mm -hmm. a couple days ago watch the uh, the Gran Turismo movie, which oh, is like is not not only is that Sony Pictures, but it's like. I don't know if it's a subdivision, but it's like PlayStation Pictures. Like it actually has like the PlayStation logo, not just That's, the Sony logo. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and I don't know exactly how those different entities fit within Sony, but fun movie. I enjoy it. Oh, um, okay. So yeah, it's it's not it too. Yeah. The trailers made it look party because like, he's a gamer. What did he know about racing? Uh, I, oh, it, it, there's a little bit of that in like the first ten to fifteen minutes, but then it, then it kind of mellows out. So if okay. you can get through that. Uh, it's a pretty good movie. Yeah, but, I, I didn't know uh, anything about it, so it's nice to hear that it's actually pretty decent. Mm -hmm. So uh, Miyamoto, obviously a longtime producer for Nintendo, uh, has spoken through the Nintendo Japanese Twitter account uh, a few short statements about plans for the movie. Supposedly, this has been something that's been in discussion off and on in some capacity for a long time. I, I don't see the, the the direct primary source for this, but apparently, like for at least ten years, but. Uh, no other details about like casting or time or if it's going to be an original story or cover an event of, a, of another title or what, but in development or at least in planning stages with uh, the producer Avi Arad, the director Wes Bell, Nintendo and Sony Pictures Entertainment. Who would you like to see as Link? Whoever played like, the CDI version. The Excuse Me Princess Link. Tom Whoever. Holland, sorry. <laughs> Who? Tom Holland. Tom Holland. <laughs> Spider Man. Oh, the, 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 the Spider Man. Uh, the <laughs> that's the one that's going around, yeah. Yeah. So. I, I, um, <laughs> who, who else? I don't know like, who would actually be good for Link, to be honest. I have no idea. Like, I, I'm just, I was like, I don't know who, whoever played Legolas and the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> that's uh, Orlando Bloom. 
Oh, okay. Like yeah, there you go. Put up the <laughs> it's a, okay. I actually want. I, I, actually, it'd be really to see if like had they had an older link for this live action. That'd be awesome. Punish link. Uh, I don't know. I don't know who who else. It'd be it'd be cool to have like a Zelda Williams cameo somewhere in there. That'd be great. Um. I, I did see, uh, I think Alex tweeted that, and I know it's probably several people have tweeted that, mm-hmm. that, you know, Zelda Williams has been kind of like an unofficial spokesperson for that brand uh, in, in in different capacities. It'd be really kind of a real neat kind of reward, callback. Yeah, yeah, I did that. To just have a, give her a cameo, if possible. Um, and then I did find a tweet that was posted on the official Nintendo Twitter account, and then again on that same Japanese account, but in English, basically saying that we have now started production uh let's see we have now officially started the development of the film with nintendo uh heavily involved in the production it'll take time until completion but i hope you look forward to seeing it so seems like it's still a ways off but officially in development i i think as a as a result of this you know what i'm really looking forward to it's not it's not the live action zelda itself it's the game adaptation of the live action zelda Zelda Legend of Zelda, the, the movies of the game. <laughs> there we go. Now we're cooking. It should be an FMV game. Oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> but um, video, also, yeah, correction, I think, excuse me, Princess, wasn't CDI Zelda. That was Cartoon Zelda. Was it? No, I, 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 I bend those together. Sorry. It was the same era. <laughs> same era. <laughs> same era. Thank you for the reaction. But, 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 but Video game adaptations recently, including not a video game explicitly, but like the Dungeons and Dragons adaptation, uh, then Gran Turismo, uh, Mario movie, of course, is the big point of reference there. Uh, the Sonic um, films all, also were big as well. Son- yeah, Sonic movies. It, it, basically, you know, we're not in the dirge. As that we far were, as like, live action ago. goes, it's not, it's anime, but like, I haven't seen it, but apparently One Piece Netflix is like decent. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's sort I of like, a lot hey. Of now I know that's not that's an anime being live action, not a game going live action. But it's like, hey, live action stuff sometimes works out okay. <laughs> so yeah, the, I, I I heard that like the like the really the big key factor for that project like it was Oda, you know, the author of heavily involved, like being right? yeah heavily involved with that, and they they also have a live action uh, adaptation of Yu Yu Hakusho. Yeah, coming they just up, released a trailer for that. <laughs> yeah, I watched that trailer. I was like, I don't know, I like, really like Yu Yu Hakusho, but. I'm kind of. Uh, I still, I still, I still can't uh, shake off like the the trauma of the Death Note live action. You know what the <laughs> best live action is? Oh, yeah? The Hong Kong version of Street Fighter called Super Cop. I mm, did I see That's that? That's a very Chow statement. I, I, I'm trying to think if I've seen that or not. Fuck, it's been so long. It sounds familiar, but I don't know if I've seen it. Shit, but hey, oh, wait, best of luck. Oh, yeah, I got the title wrong. Future Cops. That's what they call it. Uh, best of luck. They, they're also doing an adaptation of uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender. They oh, yeah. a trailer another, for that. hopefully better than the movie. That was a, that's, that's that's an example of a bad live action. Animation. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes. And I'm I'm not the biggest Avatar fan though. I did watch it growing up, and the the new Netflix trailer for that does. It's a lot more promising. Mm. Obviously, I, 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 I think the thing I, yeah. I think the thing that uh, is hanging people up with that project is I think somewhere in develop in the development of that I think the creators of Avatar were on board and then they. They said due to creative differences, they they were uh, oh. they cut off the project. So who knows how that's gonna? It's like what? What does out. that mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, you know, if 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 it's gonna be, you know, I, hopefully this is great. You know, I think there's a lot of potential with the live action Zelda movie being done well. Mm. So I, I hey, I, I think Miyamoto really likes this, based on the success of uh, the Super Mario movie. I'm sure he's very very enthusiastic. And the last major piece of news that we have is more general gaming. And that is, as far as I'm aware, a very surprise announcement of a Steam Deck OLED. So not quite a Steam Deck 2 or a Steam Deck Pro, but a refresh of the Steam Deck. The Steam Deck came out, what, in late 2021, early 2022, and it was when most people could get it. Do I have my years wrong on that? Mm, it was Steam originally planned it was originally planned to release at the end of 2021 they delayed it by a couple of months because of uh like uh, some component shortages last minute for okay. the launch and so the official launch i think was late february last year 
Okay. But uh, if you hadn't, like, even if you had pre-ordered it, most people weren't able to get their hands on one until That's late summer. last year. Yeah, summer. Yeah, yeah last it, year. it was that. It was that delay of inventory that got me tripped up because I know yeah. a lot of people had to wait, like, including me, six months before I could just order and get one. Yeah, I but, pre-ordered it on launch and took about six extra months, was it? But I locked out. I, I sold mine for four hundred bucks two weeks ago. Oh, oh yeah. So yeah. So this new, new Steam Deck OLED is like it, it, obviously the big big feature of it is the new OLED screen, um, and uh, it supports uh, HDR uh, for, for games that will probably support it uh, thanks to the OLED screen. Um, I but it's much more than that, uh, right, James? Deck like, there has a way way stronger battery in it i believe um there's a there's a slight increase in the diagonal display it's not it's not seven inches anymore it's it's 7.4 so there's slightly smaller bezels now um james you're a resident steam deck expert help us (laughs) so is is my steam deck out of date uh so your performance won't be notably different there might be some instances where the faster ram will have an impact on performance but it will be no more than like uh, five to seven percent and it's really going to depend on the game how much it needs the extra memory bandwidth i could see that maybe for emulation like if you're trying to emulate uh, games on it the faster memory bandwidth might help with the cpu especially because then too cpus are really do like fast for ram so the cpu might have uh, more well for emulation the cpu might show some uh, better improvements but in actual games maybe the improved bandwidth might help the gpu so it's going to be on a game by game basis what yeah like uh, like like i saw i i watched the digital foundry video breakdown uh, of this and like this the side by side comparisons like you know you're, 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 like the, the, realistically like the, the most performance increases you're going to get is like maybe like Three to five an FPS increase for some games. Yeah, you know? which for some games that might be the difference between dipping down to like twenty eight FPS to having a locked thirty FPS. Yeah, and right. one of the new changes to the Steam Deck OLED for the screen is that it's a ninety hertz refresh rate. And mm. one of the things they're doing is that, uh, and it sounds like they're changing the way that the frame caps work in Steam OS, so that if you have a a refresh rate below 45 FPS, then it will frame double so that it's kind of like how um, on the PS5, some games like, for example, Street Fighter 6, you're you're running it at 60 FPS in a match. But if you have 120 hertz like capable display, it can like have it in that 120 hertz container. And there is like an input responsiveness uh, improvement. Uh, there's less input lag so it sounds like that's something they're going to be doing since it's a 90 hertz display 30 fps you have frame tripling so it's so you're going to one of the main problems with the original steam deck is that the frame limiter even if it's like the built-in frame limiter even if it's great for frame pacing the latency penalty has been pretty noticeable to the point where unless you're playing a slower paced game where you don't really need the responsiveness of the controls it's generally best to not use the built-in frame limiter because it just imp- it like introduces so much more lag. So it sounds like with what they're doing here, it might be better, but obviously need need to get my hands on with it to know for sure. Uh, but yeah, the screen itself is obviously the most like important improvement here. Not even counting the uh, refresh rate improvement, which obviously some lower like end games like i'd imagine hades you'll be able to get a higher than 60 hertz refresh rate just fine because it's like 60 fps on switch you can probably get like 90 hertz on a steam deck oled no problem because there's plenty of games now where you can hit 60 fps just fine and you have a bit of overhead so might as well take advantage of it and also well, another key factor is like uh people have been noting like on the on the hands-on uh the, the media outlets is like uh, this is uh there's like a even though it's slightly uh weighs less weighs uh 30 like it's like weighs five percent lighter like it's actually pretty noticeable to, to the people who uh tried it out this new steam OLED. it's like yeah it's just uh, noticeably lighter i wonder uh, if that has to do with the weight distribution and the handheld itself because true. i do know that uh because a lot of the weight was centered obviously 
around the screen and the battery. If if the weight reductions are around there, mm. it means that the weight distribution is more even across the entire device, and that might be what's uh, making point. it what's making it feel a lot better. But anyways, it's like obviously this isn't a Steam Deck two. Valve has said that they are making a Steam Deck two, but they've also said that the hardware isn't there yet for it to be a massive enough improvement, which is true. Uh, one of the things that you even have developers like Durante on like uh, Reddit coming out to say that, yeah, one of the main things about the Steam Deck that's so notable is that, yeah, you have the ROG Ally, you have the Legion Go that are coming out and they have stronger chips. But at the power draw that matters, like under 10 watts, the Steam Deck is outperforming those chips. <laughs> so and like even before the battery upgrade in the Steam Deck OLED, like the Steam Deck had the best battery of any of those handheld PCs. And now you're getting a 30 to 50 percent improvement, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's the difference between always having to have a charger on you to, OK, I can comfortably use this and not have to worry about being next to an outlet. So and, and, and for people who don't mind, like uh, still getting the 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 current gen version not the, not these new oled models the the lcd versions that are uh, that have been out for over a year now they they have price reductions too uh while yeah. supplies last so the 64 gigabyte lcd models 350 dollars and the 512 gigabyte lcd models down to 450 dollars while supplies last so if you don't mind if you just want a a lower price steam deck now without you don't care about the oled improvements you can get one at a pretty reasonable price Oh, yeah, you can grab like one of those 64 gigabyte OLEDs and then, well, not OLEDs, 64 gigabyte LCDs, and then just put in a uh, a larger uh, SSD yourself. But even better, um, you can get a refurbished Steam Deck directly from Valve. So right now you can get a 512 gigabyte refurbished uh, LCD Steam Deck for 359 dollars okay. and it comes with the same warranty oh okay yeah that's that's yeah, a i was deal. really lucked up that i sold mine for 400 bucks but yeah it's like i mean the steam deck was already like far and away the best value like handheld gaming pc and like it's very clear that like valves in it for the long run they've <laughs> they've confirmed they're gonna make another one they've done they're doing this huge hardware revision like Gamers Nexus just put out a, a teardown video for the OLED model like today, mm -hmm. and basically every component in it has been changed in some fundamental way wow. to make it a better like built machine. Like down to the fact that like on the original model, they said, OK, the way that the um, the charger I see works uh, with how close it is to the battery it, it it was like fine, but it was worrying temperatures. So one of the things they've done is instead of having one IC, they have two of them now in parallel. That way the uh, load is being distributed so that that's no longer a problem. And then there's all sorts of things like they've halved the number of memory modules, but they're smaller, denser kits. And because they have they're smaller and denser, they've like if you look at the like actual like motherboard it seems like it's uh like empty in a lot of places but it's actually because they've dedicated so much more of the uh, traces to the signal integrity because you have the denser modules that are also faster so they're making sure that it's it's very smart stuff all across the board and I'm very excited to get my hands on with one I think I'm gonna wait for uh, a Steam Deck too uh, to to replace mine. Uh, but I'm really, really excited to see, like, if this is the proof they're doing it, like, kind of like a, a model refresh. Like, how big of a leap will be the Steam Deck? Uh, what they're playing for the Steam Deck too, essentially. My like, yeah. the number one thing I want from a Steam Deck too. What's up? And it's, it's, it's a very silly thing. I'm teeing this up in a dumb way. The the official case for the Steam Deck currently doesn't have a slot for the. Charger, which it's a USB it charger does. with a power brick at the end. It, not it does. mine, and I got the. It's sure? it's it's that slip thing on the back. Oh, it's like the little, little hollow, the hollow yeah. out the uh, thing at the back. That's where you're supposed to put the charger. Really? Let me grab it. I'll be right back. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, wait, I was like, does he want it like at the top slot because that would like uh, like hit the screen? But then yeah, you're right. It's like, oh yeah, there's like a hollowed out back version where the strap uh, the, tuckers it in. 
Oh, yeah. All right, I see this, but like, there's nothing that holds it in place. It's gonna fall out of there. It, it's the strap that holds it in place, pretty much. But, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's it's not perfect. It's not perfect. No, I, I wish it was like a zippered compartment. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's an elegant but, and, and, solution for what it is. Yeah, and now you can get like you can get like aftermarket. Um, yeah, I don't know, that's the right term, but you can get third party cases that do have it configured differently. But yeah, that was my but, one gripe. Yeah, I still like, believe in it. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it's not a, it's not it's not a perfect solution for it. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm going to pick up one of these. Uh, it helps that I'm in in a in a region where I can easily sell my old uh, Steam Deck to someone local, so I don't have to worry about shipping and whatnot. And it's like, okay, well, I use it enough that it it makes sense to get the better screen, especially since like it, like. I've been getting into HDR recently because I got a new monitor that has proper HDR and seeing like the specs for the screen on this. It's like, oh, man, this is going to be incredible. You're going to be surrounded but, by HDRs by the end of the year. You're going to have like your, your Steam Deck OLED on one, one end and then surrounded by your HDR screens. It's gonna, you, you live in the HDR world now. I wish but, uh, I could find a decent HDR monitor that's 32 inch without going 4K, but... Why would you want to go 32 inches if you're not going to go 4K? Fuck 4K. It's just a waste of power, man. Wh why would you go 32 <laughs> inches for 1440p? That's what I would use. It looks great. Who uses fucking 4K, man? You're the only guy with a 4090 card. Uh, both Adam and Brian have 4090s. <laughs> Damn, you guys. <laughs> Child's like, fuck everyone who's using 4K. I don't fucking get it. Fuck everyone! I love that the, the, the child's the old man yells at the cloud mo moments. This is this is this is my only real hobby, so that's why I spend too much on it. But, oh. but yeah, no, and um, but one thing that I never said at the start is that the the Steam Deck OLED is coming out um, November sixteenth. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm just throwing so the next corner. week. <laughs> yeah, so who knows? Yeah, yeah, who, yeah, who, yeah, who knows what it's going to be in terms of like availability? I assume high, but also I assume that Steam has kind of ironed out kinks having gone through the rigmarole once before with the with the, with the product stream i still think hopefully, it's a miracle that I was, able to, I was able to get my steam deck uh, uh pre-ordered the first one but it came up like it took it took like maybe 10 minutes i was like oh my god i somehow got i secured one because <laughs> I, I, I remember that roller coaster that was a trip And with that, we'll go into one sales update and then a handful of upcoming release dates or at least release windows for the back half of this year and early next. Uh, a decent number of headlines here, so we'll roll through them. The major sales update that we have is that Persona 5 Strikers, if you remember that, it's the Omega Force sequel slash spinoff hybrid for Persona 5, has sold over 2 million units. Yeah. Which, for a lot of other series, they'd kill to hit sell 2 million units and then the spinoff does for uh, Persona 5. Uh, it was I, a, pr a pretty damn good game. Like I, I remember enjoying it. Uh, I was playing it. Would you wish to do an version with oil content? Um, Not really. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't want to replay <laughs> the game just because Kasumi's there now or whatever, you know? Yeah, that'd, that'd be... Imagine if they did it the same way where you could only access the, the new content by beating it first and you, and you can't save over progress if you already beat the original version. Um, that'd be and weird. Zenkichi is good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's good. I I like the yo-yo chick too. She's funny. Sophia. Yeah. 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 Good game. So, so one thing yeah. that's sort of annoying about Sega's um, the way they reveal like sales numbers, and it's actually pretty rare for them to have like something like this where they say this game sold two million. They they oftentimes group it by like franchise. Or sometimes even in Persona's case, like sub franchise, like the Persona Five series has sold nine million, but that includes Strikers, that includes uh, the original Persona Five, that includes Royal, and the way Sega categorizes it, they call Royal's re-release like separate from Royal, like the basically anything that's not the P PlayStation version. Um, mm -hmm. But I believe Persona Five Royal, last we knew, is around three point five million, roughly. And that's not including original Persona 5. So it gets kind of tricky. But yeah, 2 million for the spinoff. It's pretty good. That's yeah, really it's good. A, it, 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 yeah, it's a total genre shift too. And you knew if, like, if people, if fans were going to get on board or not. And 
seems to have really paid off in a bit of gray. Going into the back part of 2023, uh, one of the things we'll announce first, because it's not a single release date, but upcoming support for a release game for the next several months, that is Lords of the Fallen. Before I go on, has anyone here played it? I know a lot of people were interested. I don't know who's actually booted up and played it yet. James played yet. little, uh, I think. Yeah. I've I've been doing other things like reviewing. It's like been a busy. <laughs> it's, it's it's been a busy couple of months, and I know I know we've had a few people interested in this. Just trying to clear time, I know is yeah. really hard. But no, so Lords of the Fallen, we recently got the announcement of it selling over a million copies alongside its contemporary Lies of P, uh, and then developer CI Games has released basically a roadmap for upcoming free content. So this is free content, not announcement of like a DLC triple pack or what you, what you might expect for uh, like a season pass, which is genuinely good. Like they are saying that like they're going to support this game with balance updates, tweaks, little added quests here or there, new gear sets. Um, things are like quality of life, like gamepad remapping, like being all the remap buttons, uh, how new game plus works. Like all of these things genuinely are like really cool that they're they weren't. They didn't. They didn't meet the uh, release scope of the game, which was received pretty well. And they're they're still going to improve what on what they have. Okay, I, my my only concern uh, because the, the way this content is currently in development thing is is structured. I don't know if it's sequential or not, or like when these updates are coming. So, like for example, the first two things they have on there is the Halloween event and the mob density reduction, and both those have launched already. Then they list a whole bunch of other stuff out there, like Umbral armor set, questline inventory expansion number one, what after it. Um, new spells pack number one, um, and so forth, and then like the, the, almost to the end, the third to the end is gamepad rebinding, and I don't know if that means that we have to wait for all this other stuff to push first before a basic function, which is yeah. gamepad rebinding. Yeah, but uh, the, what I was gonna get to is like the other shoe, and this is a small shoe. Like I do want to say, it's very, it's very cool that they're doing all this. Just the graphic that they've chosen to use is hard to parse. It's a lot of block art in a fashion that looks like a timeline, but it's not clear. And then on top of that, they have like ongoing weekly enhancements where they have things like stability, performance, QOL, <laughs> QOL tweaks. Like okay, that's you know it's cool to show that the the level of commitment is kind of nice, but I think like the graphic could have been cleaned up. And it's, I know I sound like nah, the, how dare your graphic sound uh, be so like hard to parse. I, I, I guess I, I I wish there was like a more firm like release date time frame or release window for it. Hey, remember the like, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven roadmap? Yeah, there was like, like a nine month. Extreme. There was like a nine month window in that. It was just like continual updates. Like, oh, and they nice. didn't meet like any of it. <laughs> so I was like, okay. I feel um, I feel like I'm being too hard to please or something. But that one, it was like so sparse on details. Like I want more. This one, it's like okay, here's everything we plan to do. It's like I I, I can't parse this. I want less. So I was like. I feel I feel like I'm being hard to please, but uh, it's just it's hard to know. Like like Josh said, if you're really interested in the gamepad remapping, when is that coming? At least based on the graphic itself, the roadmap, it's not clear. Potentially, if you go to like the newsletter or a, a social media account, it might be detailed in another fashion somewhere else. But it's it's not clear based on just the roadmap that they that they put out there. Uh, but it looks like Lords of the Fallen. If you really have, if you've either not played the game yet or you're continuing to play it uh through new game plus and things like that it's looks like it's done really well for ci games uh and they're going to continue to support it pretty heftily throughout the rest of 2023 this does clearly say 2023 so ostensibly within the next couple months but, uh, months we're in november uh that's true month and a half right <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, by months and half weeks are... Is this the level five plan? Also, of like having everything we launch in twenty twenty three, and then towards the November, at least never announced anything. Mm, more, more on that. Oh later. wait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first coming release in also less than a week is the DLC for Remnant Two. This is the Awakened King, and we did we. Did we know about this before this week, or is it new as of this week? I feel like it's new. I don't know if they. I don't know if they announced it before. I, I, I we think knew DLC have... was coming. We just. I don't think we specifically knew what each DLC Details. would be. Right. Gotcha. So the Awakened King is coming out on November fourteenth, 
And then in addition to just details of the DLC itself, we got an additional trailer focusing on a new archetype called the Ritualist. Now, remind me, Josh and James, you're the two that have played uh, Remnant 2. Do do I read archetype as basically class pretty, pretty or much. job? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. so yeah. So because because but in the game you can like you can like like equip like certain items that'll like change your class on the spot, pretty much. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean the the ritualist uh, looks neat. It's a it's a class that is uh, specializes in negative status effects, and then so you kind of get get like bonus damage on like on enemies that are like inflicted like status ailments like bleed. Poison, corrupt, or corroded, or whatever, overloaded, um, and uh, as like uh, one of the things they uh, skills they like noted for that is like you can kind of like curse yourself for, to kind of get a big damage boost and life steal. You no longer can like heal normally, but you get like big damage and big life steal in exchange for that. So it's a very uh, risk versus reward type of class. So kind of neat, um, pretty interesting. I, I, li- I like all the screenshots and like the. The wizard, the wizard had aesthetic. It's going it's, for. It's neat how this DLC is working because the way that Remnant Two uh, uh, is uh, structured is that you get these three main areas, and they're like randomly generated. Like there's like at launch, at least there was like two different storylines that each like world could co- could be like uh, based off of, and then there was some like slight variations each time. Uh, so reading the trailer description for the DLC on YouTube, this is uh, taking place in, I hope I pronounce this right, uh, Lassam? Yeah. yeah Lassam, so, yeah. so since I believe, did they, did they say how many DLCs there was going to be, like, three. overall? Just, yeah. Three. Okay. It's interesting, because so, they say first so, of three planned, but no, like, season pass or anything offered. For okay, them. okay. So then it seems like, again, we don't know for sure, but it sounds like what's probably going to be with the DLCs is there's going to be an additional story for each of the three main areas, and they're basically expanding upon what sorts of things you can come across in playthroughs. That yeah, seems because, like yeah, what they're doing. Yeah, the, the, like like uh, because like in the, in the Lassam, like uh, one of the storylines is like uh, about uh, mm. about this false king like being an imposter of like the real king, and then like and then there's like two versions of this fight depending on like if you're like in like uh, the real world or like the, like the dark shadow world, and then so it gives you like different options of like which. Well, type Lassam, of boss. Well, Lassam it there were the two different uh versions of the story was the dual kings and yeah. then the af- then the like completely different like uh dreamweaver or whatnot right yeah so so yeah and, so, and then this one seems to be following up on like one of those storylines so it makes you wonder like, like you said the other two are like probably the other two areas but which storyline they're going to expand which is a pretty yeah. interesting like uh twist on like the, the dlc uh how they're framing the dlc which, because I, I actually do like the like the storylines in the game, so it's really yep. cool to see like them following them up on that. Like, oh shit, we get to like go against the real king now that they were talking about uh, throughout the game. And that storyline, that's fun. Are either you two planning to play this when it comes out next week, or again, yeah. pack, pack for oh, yeah, the year? Uh, yeah, or, yeah, I, I, I do need to reinstall it. I keep, I, 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 I forget to reinstall it because I've been like working on like three other things too. Because I've been working on the like a dragon god and guides too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been playing through. Uh, like, I, I can say that that we have it because the preview embargo mm-hmm. left. I've been playing through Persona Five Tactica, mm-hmm. almost mm-hmm. done with it. So it's like uh, I'm probably going to uh, play this when it comes out. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the, there's a, there's a, almost a minor slip up on Persona Five Tactica earlier this week where Steam almost, released that game uh, early. Almost, if if anyone had booted that up and then immediately went into offline mode, uh, they could still be playing this right now. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so fair enough. But for, for but for people who did it in time, couple more days, couple more days. In late November on the 30th, we're getting the global launch for Black Clover M Rise of the Wizard King. The last time this was covered on RPG site was last year, uh, in late 2022, when it was announced. Uh, so it's going to come out on the 30th. Those that are interested can pre-register for either um, Google Play or iOS based on which ecosystem you're in. And then we got new trailers, both in English and Japanese, for the launch of the game. 
Brian, tell me everything think... you know about Black Clover. I was gonna say, like, I don't think anyone here is big into Black. <laughs> I think I've watched like the first six episodes. Yeah, that's uh... a lot. <laughs> Holy shit! Okay, I, 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 I don't know. I, I did. I never. I've never read a chapter. I never watched an episode. I know. I think the main character's name is Asta. So he has like white hair, and I know, like, like when the first like few episodes he... were airing, people were really were complaining about his voice. Yeah, they were meaning about this kind of like the screeching scream that he does when he's shocked or something. I remember a lot of people talked about it. And, and in both languages, if I remember. He, I think this he is... Like a crow. I do know that for Black Clover, like, the anime series ended, but the manga was ongoing, I think. And then there was, like, a movie. But the movie was a while ago, too. Anyways, my thought is, I feel like this game is sort of late. So I don't think the anime... Black Clover fans chime in. <laughs> well, how do you feel about it, Black Clover or M? I don't know. Uh-huh. It 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 does feel like Black Clover was most popular like three years ago, right? And I, it does I, feel I, like it's a little late. I, I remember also there wasn't there like a console project of Black Clover that released that was like multiplayer focused as well, something like that. Uh, that I when I was like... writing up this post, remember when Konami announced like an RPG for that? I forget what it's called. It's like that. It's the fairy tale, but not fairy tale. It's like that uh, same yeah. artist. But it's a different. Series. Was it for mobile? Uh, let me look this up. Oh man, <laughs> I think it was. There's a mobile game too, but there was a console I, game. I, I, oh, Eden I Zero. That... Eden oh, there Zero. We go. Something like Eden that. Eden Zero. Yes. And like, when was that? Like, uh, no, that was like that was announced in 2020. Theory. Oh my god! And we haven't heard anything since. I oh. think it must be deep in development for and sure. Like, is that anime still airing? I don't know. Uh baby probably i i thought it's space fairy tale yeah but yeah black clover m in two weeks so black, black black clover fans uh fairy tale fans and eden zero fans chime in we're sorry that we can't speak to these series <laughs> <laughs> we're a bunch of dumbasses so we're, we're returning to you <laughs> Uh, going into December, December, I think we talked about this briefly last week. Uh, now we have a date. This is the last DLC for Wolong Fallen Dynasty. Upheaval in Zhang Zhan releases on December 12th. Chow, correct me if I'm pronouncing that wrong, uh, which is almost certainly true. Uh, the Neo 2 crossover is also live. I haven't played it yet. But yes, yeah, so that'll come out in a month or so. The last update for Wolong. Now the the upheaval in oh um, sorry Chow Jing Zhang uh is that like new story content? They I, they are I know. Sorry, they the two other DLCs are new story content, but they're like they're like standalone, like they don't interface with the main story oh, really okay. in any meaningful way. It's just... But also, if you've played Neo Two or Wo Long, this I don't want to say the story doesn't matter, but it's it's not. The focus. I uh, yeah, the way yeah. the way that Kite writes this DLC is this DLC gives uh, is loosely based on the historical moment where Liu Bei went to seek refuge with his fellow kinsman Liu Bao. Bio. So, hmm. okay. I, right. it's, I apologize if I'm pronouncing these names improperly. <laughs> yeah. I wish they pronounced no, Anthony style, but nobody knows what they sound like in Cantonese because they never offer that kind of magic. How do you pronounce this name that is looks like Cow Cow, but it's not Cow Cow? How do you say that? You, yeah. Usually I hear it as Chow Chow. Chow Chow. No, it's not. In, in Cantonese, it's a uh, Tol Tol. It's, yeah, totally, it's like, totally it's, it's like I, I, I know like the pro- pro- proper Dutch pronunciation is like T S A O. It's like South South. Okay. Yeah, but I'm just mm-hmm. saying like in Cantonese, that's what you sound like. So it's like. It, 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 back, back in the good old English dub days, like in Dynasty Warriors 2 and 3, they did pronounce it as Cow Cow. It was yes. really funny, but, but, not, but not correct. <laughs> but, but that it's old like, it's like hilarious. A, what was that? Don't don't chase after Lubu, or is it the other one where the guys cast? Do not pursue him? Lubu. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My favorite one is the one where they're doing like magic when you're fighting the yellow turbans or something. Yeah, the Zhang Jiao, uh, the Swiss <laughs> Cassia. When does the power of my magic? And that, <laughs> that, was, that was excellent, excellent. Uh, I, I I recreated one to one as well. Also in December, we're getting the DLC for Darkest Dungeon 2 called Darkest Dungeon The Binding Blade. 
I thought that was the Fire Emblem <laughs> title at first. The Stark like, Deity. Blade. Duh. No, oh. Binding Blade. Like, wait, what, what? So what, I always forget, like, according to Fire Emblem Heroes, what is the subtitle for Fire Emblem 6? The Binding Blade. Oh, is it? Yeah. Is it actually? That's, that's the official title now. Oh, okay. Because I, I, I know was... sometimes I still go back to Sword of Seals. Is kind yeah, of I, I, I like the Sword of Seals. It sounds a lot cooler. But what yeah. can we do? Oh, no, so this is not Fire ever. Emblem, The Binding Blade. This is Darkest Dungeon 2, The Binding Blade. I thought oh, Josh was confused yeah. with that Dark Deity game, which is like the Fire Emblem-like, which was some other <laughs> dark game that he got confused with. <laughs> no, I got, I it's The Binding Blade that I got confused by, but uh, it, it turned out to be The Binding Blade. Yeah. Well, this is better than what happened to The Blazing Blade, which just became just known as Fire Emblem. <laughs> no, no, I, it, no, it was always known as Fire Emblem, and then over time they kind of sort of added... Blazing Blade no, back no, no, to Japan it. It was always called a Blazing Blade. You no, know, yeah, I know, so, but it's Reckon Re- Re- no Ken or whatever. Yeah. In in the West, I feel like that game they've slowly have added a subtitle back to it as Blazing right. Blade when it never had one initially. Because now there's like saying, alliteration. <laughs> what we're blade. saying this is this is not a uh, Fire uh, Emblem is more interesting. <laughs> there's yeah. not there's not a Fire Emblem Darkest Dungeon two collab. That's not what it is. Anyways, and, I feel like Darkest Dungeon one made a splash, and then Darkest Dungeon two, I. I might be completely off base. I just haven't like heard much of it. I, I haven't heard great things about people who were into Darkest Dungeon One and, and Darkest Dungeon Two. I, I think, I, I think, I think it's the div- divisive, divisive, best. I want to say, but we could be wrong, and all the Darkest Dungeon fans will also yell at us in the comments. <laughs> I don't know. So go, go, going to our old friend Steam charts, uh, uh, Darkest, Darkest Dungeon. He. Uh-huh. I was looking at so, I was looking at who is currently in game. Darkest Dungeon two has one thousand people, and Darkest Dungeon one has like twenty five hundred people. There we and go. Granted, it's an older game; it's cheaper, more people have it, but still. And yeah. also, Darkest Dungeon two, like, uh, wasn't it like an Epic Store uh, game store yes. exclusive at first too? Yes. So it also has that effect on it as well. But yeah, so the the Binding Blade will release. Uh... In December, though not, we don't have a specific date. Just December, which seems interesting for a month out. Uh, it will introduce two new heroes: the Duelist and the Crusader, and a new mini boss, the Warlord. I think that's it for December. Going into 2024, now that we're finally starting to flesh this out a little bit more, uh, the first two announcements are a couple of games that are delayed. So, Broken Roads. This is a indie Fallout like that was set in uh, Australia, post apocalyptic Australia, is being delayed to 2024. This is a last minute delay, <laughs> a very yeah. last minute delay. It was originally supposed to release um, next week. I guess I'll just say that we we have someone. Paige was covering it, and she was running into a lot of polish issues. Yeah, quite and literally. What like the story this- is here is that they sent out review code for this game, Broken Roads, and then reviewers who were playing the game under embargo, hours included, were basically like, man, this is really buggy and running into all sorts of issues and, uh, you know, that feedback got back to the developers and they were like, yeah, we can't release this. So they delayed it. Yeah. It, so the, good on that. From the, from the things we saw and behind the scenes, that it, uh, it, it is, uh, uh, they really needed this delay. They really needed this. The, the reviewers didn't know they were literally getting what they were, uh, what the title pop promised. Broken roads. Mm-hmm. Holy shit, they weren't kidding. But but good on them, and uh, hopefully it does get the time that it needs to be polished up into what they actually envision the game should be. No release window other than twenty twenty four. The citing polish and the need for more QA as the for the reason for the delay. I think they say early, but. Yeah, but, but uh, hey, at the very least, you know what? The reviewers of this game, they're like, oh man, that's awesome. We get a lot more time <laughs> to, to get through this and maybe do guide stuff as well. <laughs> and then another game that is being delayed to 2024. Uh, we talked about level five and their day loser releases for 2023, which is slowly coming to a close. Uh, Fantasy Life I, The Girl Who Steals Time, has been officially delayed to 2024. In addition to that, Level 5 has announced Level 5 Vision, which is their like their direct show. Level 5 Vision 2023-2 is set for November 29th for more details on upcoming titles, including Inazuma 11 Victory Road, Deca Police, the 
aforementioned Fantasy Life, The Girl Who Steals Time, Megaton Musashi Wired, and The New Professor Layton, and The New World of Steam. So what do we think? How many of these are still releasing in 2023? <laughs> um, None of them. I, None I, of these games are going to release. I don't, I don't, I, I'm trying to think, like, you can't, I don't think you can really, like, release them in this window I, anymore. I feel like, like if they were to announce the game, get... like, to, like, on Monday, like, this is coming out December 22nd, they could. But you, like, need, you need to prep retailers as well. Yeah, like, I, I feel like you have, a, you could maybe announce something five weeks out, but, like, it would be landing, like, right on Christmas. It's like, maybe not. <laughs> Yeah, so I, that, it's kind of it's kind of crazy. Like their first level five vision, twenty twenty three, was like back in March, and like they announced like all this stuff, and then <laughs> the sequel to their to their uh, twenty twenty three vision is delaying all of that to next year. Uh, yeah, the hey, name uh, of the event. Deca Police looks cool. When I saw this, no, I'll play yeah. Deca Police whenever it releases. Oh, I, well, yeah. and, and James was able to see that. Uh, was it yep. Tokyo Game Show? Yep. So and said it looked really really neat. Um, but yeah, level five vision twenty twenty three two, where the two is Roman numerals, you know, volume as in like volume two, where they <laughs> volume one they announce all the games, volume two they're all delayed. Yeah, Maybe cool one vision. will come out in December. I'll I'll, 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 I'll <laughs> say that. Maybe one will come out. In, like, I th- I think I think the, if there was one that to come out that is the most likely to come out is like Megaton Musashi. I think. Um, mm-hmm. Other than that, I don't think anything else has a, has a shot. Because Mekatan Masashi is pretty much a re-release of like content that already came out. Mm-hmm. Slash global release. Right? Yeah. But other than that, I don't see any of these titles coming this year. Into 2024, we have a few console port announcements. So Neptunia Sisters vs. Sisters will land on Nintendo Switch in January on the 23rd. This is a weird press release. <laughs> How so? Okay, so this is a two-part press release where they announced the release date for the Nintendo Switch version, uh, which is whatever. And then the second part was they released a trailer for it, but it was the Xbox version of the game. And they didn't announce a release date for the Xbox version. It was to show the the swimsuit DLC is also coming to the Xbox version. And that they they, they so now there's like a, a, a feature disparity in between these the, the switch and xbox versions of this game where in the switch version of this game you have two new playable characters coming to the switch version only and the swimsuit dlc is also coming to the switch version but only in the digital deluxe edition of the switch version while the xbox version does not have those two playable characters but the swimsuit dlc is going to be available in all versions of the xbox version and that, but the yeah. Xbox version does not have a release date. So I'm looking at our news post as you say this. So I was able to follow that, but good luck if you were listening and try to follow that. Uh, I love I love feature creep or whatever you want to call it in between versions. Of- yeah, yeah, feature bring out bring out the spreadsheet. I had had to literally fucking just like okay, just to, uh, like as a recap of this. This is what's in the, the Nintendo Switch version. This is what's in the Xbox version because they even had like a little table at the press release. I'm like, this is so stupid. <laughs> like, goddamn it. So the Xbox version is not dated, but we yes. know what's going to come on it. And then the Switch version, we just this week got the date, January 23rd. But some of the features are hidden behind the deluxe the, version. The swimsuit DLC is oh, digital deluxe edition. In all versions of the Switch will have the playable, the, the new playable character. Gotcha. Hmm. And Xbox will not have the playable characters, but we'll have swimsuit DLC and we'll launch sometime next year. Yes. All right. Also in February, we're getting the console release on PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series for King Arthur Knight's Tale. This is like the dark fantasy uh, CRPG that originally released on PC last year uh, in mid-2022. So it'll be releasing on consoles um, in February next year. Here is an announcement that Kite put up on the site uh, just this week from Compile Heart. Toho Spell Carnival will be launching on PlayStation and Switch in spring 2024. Currently only announced for Japan, as far as I can tell. I don't know if we expect to see this based on the developer 
in English later at some point. They released the whole kind of the less. I mean, that, not, not this, the main like but the spinoff. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So this this was part. This is one of the uh, six upcoming RPGs they announced uh, like a month ago when the when the management changed. Right. Yeah. I mean, Toho. It keeps on Tohoing along. Yeah, even a tactics RPG. I mean, that's just that, that's Toho games. Toho games like have they? I, I feel like there's no genre untouched when it comes to Toho fan games. There's so much of it. There's a shit ton of it, <laughs> more than like we could all possibly know. And then the last piece of news that we have here is based on a fiscal financial report from Neon Falcom. Falcom does plan to release a new Kaseki slash Trails game by September. 2024 in japan so i am in the english boat where for me we're looking forward to trails through daybreak uh next summer was it summer for us in the west having not played obviously kuro or kuro 2 would the new trails entry follow on kuro kuro or would it do we anticipate that would be like on like a different subseries it'll probably be it would it would be kuro uh it would be following up on kuro 1 specific well technically crow too but uh one of the funny things is is that we actually had confirmation that crow 2 basically wasn't going to exist if east 10 hadn't been delayed until this year so very curious how much uh crow 2 will actually be required for for this game i i, I don't know i don't know the crow 2 ended in a weird spot that's all i'll say yeah i need i still need to get to it um Obviously, I'm going to play Kuro 2 before this, so I can request a copy of Kuro 3. <laughs> so, yeah, but, yeah I'm um, going to speed run through all the Trail series. So it'll be interesting to see where they. I, I feel like I, I feel like I'm a vocal minority in this. I really like Kuro One a lot. I really did not like a lot of the plot elements they did in Kuro Two. Is that I know, a vocal uh, minority? I, I heard a. Lot. I heard that was a general consensus from my circle. What I, I, I what I, I heard, I heard a lot. I hear a lot of people praise Kuro too for what they did. I do not like a lot of the what, the, the story stuff they did in Kuro too. What I've heard about Kuro too is that the actual plot is kind of bleh, but the character stuff was good and the side quests were good. That's what I've heard. But I haven't again. I haven't played it yet. Yeah, it depends what what they mean by character stuff. That's that's vague. I, 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 like uh, for, for me, I feel like Kuro Two kind of. But you haven't played it. You just watched the streams, right? I watched my friend um, play it from beginning to end. Okay, to okay. End, so, okay. And, 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 and me and him were, were were translating for other friends in the stream too. Okay, okay. So yeah, it's. Ooh. From, from, from an outside <laughs> perspective, there seemed to be a lot of excitement from Curl One, so I'm excited for Daybreak. Yes, for, yeah, for a multitude of reasons, for moving away from Erebonia, for the new gameplay elements, the new engine elements, and then Curl Two just kind of felt like it came and went from my perspective. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. It's like it, it didn't I, I the will. Same highs. I will say that it sounds like at worst Curl Two is just. It's not, and I know a lot of people listening to this podcast do like Cold Steel Four, but. Again, you have to understand we are unfortunately <laughs> not big fans of it. Uh, from what from the vibe I'm getting, people that are disappointed in Kuro Two aren't disappointed in the set in the way that people were disappointed in Cold Steel Four. It's just like, man, you could tell that it what it didn't need to exist, and it shouldn't maybe shouldn't have it ex- existed. It's probably like that circle that just like Cold Steel Two. There's a circle that really hates Cold Steel 2 because they just feel like a filler game where the main plot didn't really move much until like the last end. I, I have like I have like a bullet a bullet list of points I don't I don't like about Kuro 2, but they're all like spoilers. <laughs> so like that's all I can really yeah. say. <laughs> I will have to talk with you about that once I get to uh, yeah. Kuro 2 sometime yeah. next year before Kuro 3. Mm-hmm. I'll get to it. Just gonna have to find a good point to slot it in because uh, oh god, early next year, too many games. Yeah. But yeah, so I mean, and then uh, another thing about this news is that there, uh, the, this confirms that the upcoming uh, Switch version of Kuro One is being developed in house by Falcom because I know we were, uh, we weren't sure uh, about it. Yeah, yeah, we weren't know if that was Durante or if that was uh, Falcom themselves. 
and they they said uh they're releasing uh, two new or two in-house switch ports uh by september 20th or next year um and kuro falls in that time frame that, that's dumb developing yeah. and the, just the, the reminder is that trails through daybreak was announced with its title and everything for western release next summer and then falcom announced that what we are calling now trails through daybreak which is kuro no Kiseki, is releasing in japan on switch in february so that's how the timeline works i, I yeah. think we're also anticipating like whatever this like Sometime next month, like in the Falcom investor meeting, um, they're also going to announce a new non East, non Trails game. Yeah, so it makes you wonder, like, what is that other Switch title that uh, Falcom's going to release? Is it going yeah. to be that game? Is it going to be Kuro 2? Like, I was assuming that once they announced Kuro 1, that they were going to also try and get Kuro 2 out soon so they could have Kuro 3 be a day and date release for Switch. That would make sense, but who knows? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that's the last headline for what's coming out in 2024, even though that one it would be Japan only. But yeah, like like James said, early next year, Q1 always looks like a mess. And then ine- inevitably, things that are slated for like later February or March tend to get delayed. Uh, here's our usual... Sh- you know, timely shout out for Adam has already put up a 2024 RPG release calendar up on the site. If you just search for like RPG site, RPGs 2024, or hopefully if you just search for RPGs 2024, you'll still find our site. Adam puts a lot of effort into that every year. And it's something that I refer to constantly to remind myself what's coming up. So do go ahead and give that a look if you're trying to plan out your schedule for next year like we are. We all the th- reviews that we talked about for like a Dragon Guide in and Tales of Arise Beyond the Dawn are up on the website, rpgsite.net. All the news that we covered this week are also on the website at rpgsite.net. We also do have some of the guides that uh, Josh has talked about for like Pocket Racer and a few other things on the website as well. We also have the Star Ocean remaster that we talked about extensively last week. Several guides that Chow and Adam and others have contributed to in terms of private action and pickpocketing and item creation and all that. Are also up on the site so if you're currently playing through that game still lots of good features up to help you through that you can find rpg site on all the social media channels just search for rpg site on youtube facebook twitter or instagram and you should be able to find us if you go to discord.gg slash rpg site or hit the link at the top of our homepage, you should be able to find the rpg site discord so do go ahead and join that to join the conversation there And we will be back next week with another episode of the TetraCast. I will not be present, unfortunately. I'll be traveling for Thanksgiving. I don't know if any others are um, the North American Thanksgiving. Uh, But I do think that the podcast will still be held. But uh, I'll leave it up to these guys to hold down the fort while I'm at it. So thank you in advance. I don't know, guys. Do you want to do a podcast next week? Hmm. If you take a if you take a week off, (laughs) I think it's deserved. Well, next week is just a normal weekend. Thanksgiving's the week after, right? What yeah, well, yeah. I'm just leaving. I'm just leaving early. I know. So we're probably going to do a podcast. I mean, someone has to talk about Persona Five Tactica and Super Mario yeah. RPG. All right, thanks for yeah. carrying the podcast, guys. Because I uh, don't own it. <laughs> You're not even American. Well, <laughs> I know. Like, child, like, yeah, whatever. Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, imagine a holiday. Huh? <laughs> he's, he's like, I missed my Thanksgiving, so I'm going to take off this one. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you all so much for listening. If you have any feedback, give us the rating, give us the comment on the site page or whatever podcast service of choice you listen to us through. We always like to see those. Uh, And until next week, stay safe and take care. We'll talk to you all next time. Woo, Tales of Zysteria. We love Zysteria.